Good, hello. good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Metaverse Nomads podcast, where we talk about our favorite play to earn games. Today, we're going to be covering the Star Atlas Econ paper released this week. Uh, joining me today are Jesse, Bonafide, Fancy Hat, Ray Veezy, and Ultra will not be joining us today, or he might be joining a little bit late. So, guys, how did these, what did you think about the paper? I overall? loved it. Yeah, it was great stuff. Absolutely. I'm excited about the fact that that this is probably one of the first gaming companies that is like attempting to put out their uh, information that is going to be valuable to someone that's looking at this from a play to earn perspective and not just you know kind of ducking and hiding and, and saying, well, you'll find out eventually. So it kind of allows you to do some planning. It allows you to have an idea of how you might want to participate. And so I appreciate that they're showing up this way. Yeah, before we get into the actual uh, white paper, I think it's important to just go over the, what happened in Town Hall, Town Hall 13. Uh, there wasn't much new content, content discussed. Uh, it was a lot of uh, explaining like a bit more in depth about the behind the scenes. There was a couple cool things though. You can participate in the GAL with USDC and they talked about the potential for assets that sell out being able to uh, be resold again in batches or perhaps uh, future generations issued. So a piss carve like V2, for example. Yeah, and uh, that's what went down pretty much. You know, it's interesting from the token generation event is the different ways um, that they're doing it. And I think it's unique in each different platform of the three that they're doing. Um, and fortunately, people who felt they were originally out of the, the process found ways to get involved in the process. Um, and I think that people who are interested are going to find a way to get the token. Um, so I'm excited about that. Ex excited to see what happens with it. I hope some lotteries get won. Um, but really starting to look, it's starting to shape out how Atlas and Polis are going to play a, a big piece of the game. So I want to speak to that for just a moment because it's really interesting that we find ourselves in a place in time where the process for taking part in a project like this requires that you have some knowledge and, and the ability to, to do things that it probably wouldn't expect of mainstream. Uh, there's no one that's going to be, you know, has, as people might recall, back in a day when you were helping your mom or grandma get on Facebook and walk them through all the steps or how to use their phone to, to, to send photos and do whatever. Here, we've got three exchanges. One of them is a, uh, you know, a, one of the primary exchanges, um, FTX. Uh, and then the others are decentralized exchanges. And so there's this whole process and the thing that you really have to understand to be able to participate in this. And so it's an interesting time where there's many steps involved and you really have to uh, have some knowledge of blockchain to participate. Uh, and so just goes to show you how far off we really are from mainstream adoption to be able to just, oh, what do I do? I take a credit card, I sign up here, here's my money and we're good to go. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've been thinking the same things, and I, I really think you won't see mainstream until it hits an Xbox or a PlayStation, and you're buying your blockchain cards at Target or something. You know, that's right. going to be when when people are really um, just actively playing the games and winning instead of worrying about all the tech behind it. And I still think the space is largely full of people who are blockchain people and gamers, not just one or the other. Yeah, that's one a good. Other. Yeah, oh, go ahead, go ahead, man. And, and it, it makes me think of, too, like as being that this is a, a, a space grand strategy, space opera style of game. And we keep looking to EVE as one of the uh, worlds that we might find some clues about how this might unfold. But uh, that with that game, you had a lot of people that were partic participating that were gamers, and so they didn't necessarily have the blockchain experience. So it's going to be interesting to see how that group learns to adapt and maybe become familiar with blockchain so they can participate. Yeah, I've been, well, I think we've all been reading up on Eve stuff, so to speak, all just to kind of understand what we're getting into. I don't know if any one of us is really a space gamer uh, historically in our past. So I'm trying to under, understand all the, the industrial systems and then also the politics and the interplay between the guilds. Um, and if, if 
<laughs> Star Atlas shows up anything like Eve, there's going to be a lot of intrigue and, and political uh, infighting and outfighting um, alliances and battles like we've never seen. Yeah, that's uh, that's what excites me the most about it, Banjo, right, is you look at a game like Eve that was just such a huge part of the culture. I mean, the, the, the game made national, international news on several occasions, right? And this is before the freedom of blockchain, which allows the economics of the game to actually affect the real world, right? So the the, the future for a game like Star Atlas, if done properly, is is similarly exponential. Like it could actually be 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 groundbreaking in a way like a like like some of these other uh, play to earn games are that are affecting real life communities, you know. What, what speaks to that, Bonafide, is that uh, you were the one that kind of mentioned in our Discord uh, about the book, uh, uh, Empires of Eve, is what I believe right. it's called? Yeah. And it's fascinating to think that a journalist took the time to document a story, an interaction of big events that happened in a virtual world. And here we are listening to it, you know, in this audio. Absolutely. Book. <laughs> well, I mean, this that's not the first time that's happened. It's happened before with really huge MMOs. I mean, they, they used World of Warcraft. There was a, a plague or something that happened in World of Warcraft that they actually used to study how to combat plagues in the real world. You know what I mean? So, I mean, things like that have happened before. But yeah. but now, because of blockchain and its connection to fiat, you know, you, you have a, a pathway where it real it really will <laughs> affect the real world. You know, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see. And uh, anybody who's here now is, is going to be on the cutting edge and, and, and there at the beginning, as you will, you know, as, as America's found, you know. You, you mentioned World of Warcraft. It reminded me of how the first time I ever first, I think of the first and last time I ever experienced this. When World of Warcraft, the movie came out, it was a surreal feeling because here you are in the game uh, watching this movie unfold and you're like, I recognize that place. Almost like as if you've been there <laughs> because you've spent so much, so many hours immersed in this game that now you're seeing this world unfold in a motion picture in a place that you have a familiarity with as if you'd been there before. It was really strange, surreal feeling. <laughs> yeah, it definitely was. And, and they, they actually did that movie pretty well from... Uh... I mean, I don't know how everybody felt about it, but I actually thought they, they brought that out pretty well. So that was that was well done. And, and I mean, you've had you know novels written on these games, obviously, and, and like you, you were just saying, banjo journalists documenting these games. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if you have a bit of a like a where, where things start to come together, where where you have like actual journalists chronicling what's happening in these games in real time because it's that important to the real world. And because it has a, an economy that has real world, you know, uh, implications, I can absolutely see tuning into a news channel <laughs> for things yeah, totally. related to in world events for Star Atlas. <laughs> it'll yeah. be as, it'll be as important as tuning into uh, a Squawk Box or, or CNBC right. or something like that. <laughs> you know, it'd be just that important. Like what's going on <laughs> in the markets today? Because it's going to yeah. affect my real my actual wallet here. Yeah. yeah, I don't see how you don't have a metaverse that doesn't have some sort of in internal communications pipeline, whether it's media or, or news or s propaganda, all that stuff. I think there's an appetite for it. And the first guild or group that does it is going to do something big. <laughs> Interesting uh, comment here by Grand Vizier. I think the real struggle is going to be in, the, in, the, in the inherent struggles with making decentralized technology available to the masses without bludgeoning them with technical terms we often take for granted. That's that's the, the barrier to entry is 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 an issue ongoing with these NFT games because they're so new. Um, obviously the the games that first figure out how to make that barrier to entry go away are gonna be the ones that, that are really winning. You know, I know like for instance with Axie, you can get on a mobile phone, download an app and scan a QR code and you're in the game. So yeah. I mean, they can make it that easy. Um, it's it's going to be interesting how they do it with Star Atlas, but I'm I'm sure they're looking into it. When they make it as easy as Roblox, you'll see, you know, just everyone from five and five years old and up playing games at that point. Well, you know, what's interesting is that there seems to be this trend in blockchain that it's more important to make it easy, the on ramp easier. And the off ramp is kind of like secondary thought. Just help them get in, and then, then, they, then after you're in, you've got this money invested and stuff. You're like, yeah. wait a minute, how do I get this out? 
Yeah, got to have the off ramps, but you know those off ramps are going to be uh, fully monitored by whatever local government you're living yeah. in. So everyone's going to be waiting there with their hand out. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it's any secret elected officials love new tax revenue. So the idea that uh, I know we have some people who live in the more libertarian idea of crypto in our group. <laughs> I know who you are. Um, but <laughs> but at, at the end of the day, I'm a little bit more like, OK, these governments are going to get what they want to get if we want to play. So I'm a little bit more of a um, pragmatist and I think bona fide. It's my other end of the spectrum there. Um, yeah, I'll come in on the other shoulder and uh, yeah. I'll just say that it's interesting to me that you could uh, take a, a bunch of, if, if you happen to get rich in one of these blockchain games, it's it's fairly simple to move through a DEX to whatever beach you happen to be on. And uh, <laughs> I don't really see a problem with that. I mean, more power to you. And yeah. more and more, those beaches are going to be taking those decentralized tokens. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're already doing it in a lot of places, man. One of, one of, one of my guys from, uh, from my scholarship program just showed me a picture a couple of days ago. You can buy a uh, car in the Philippines right now off SOP. They're, wow, they're taking no a down kidding. payment. Oh, yeah. I, wow. I, I'll show you guys. I'll, I'll post it later. But yeah, it's they're, they're selling cars directly for SLP, not Ethereum, not <laughs> Bitcoin, just for the wow. in-game token. Yeah. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be amazing if SLP took over their local economies completely? Kind of like they did that uh, in the Appalachian Mountains um, when they were between their, their um, government checks. They would trade soda cans as currency. Yeah. Um, and that was their currency. So I just wonder if in the Philippines, you're going to see that same thing happening with SLP. That'd be pretty interesting to see. I mean, part of that actually wouldn't be surprising because now they actually have a means through the Ronin wallet of fee free transfer to each other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, what else do they need? They have something that is a, an acknowledged store of value that they can exchange between each other without an exchange fee. So, yeah, I, mean, I can definitely see that blowing up. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how many countries in Africa where, you know, your, your cell phone minutes became currency, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. because it was more stable than the local currency. So, I mean, that's it's not for, we, we, we've used shells in the past. Right. So, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, there's plenty of room for us to be creative. Did someone say beaches and axes? <laughs> uh, the, the, just so this isn't this doesn't become an Axie Infinity podcast, but just to, to that point, uh, no one is monitoring per se the local stores, mom and pop shops, or businesses that are on the street of every corner within these smaller uh, islands, if you will, of the Philippines, right? So th it's already taking hold as far as like a main source of currency or close second to what the main the main one is, the peso, right? The Philippine peso. So yeah. uh, I would say close to 50%, in my opinion, you know, you could talk with scholars and you could ask them because you got whole families and neighborhoods that are just mm -hmm. playing the game. And then they would, they were more or less are going to interact with SLP because it's it, the off and on ramps are just that much easier to get in and out. So, yeah. um, so yeah, it's, it's spreading, but so will Polis. <laughs> you know, isn't it, and isn't it, inter isn't it interesting that a, a decentralized game uh, is becoming popular in a decentralized country. I mean, by the nature of its islands, the whole country is split apart and decentralized. Just something to think about, something different. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so I think we can move into the white paper. Uh, Jesse, yeah, can you bring us right. up? And Fancy, you want to run us through or you want me to take us through? Uh, how about we take turns? Sounds great. Well, you just got off the, uh, the town hall again, Fancy, and I think you said you read the paper twice so what's your first take of the paper so the first one i i focused mainly on all the the different types of classes they list is trying to figure out how, how that directly works the second one reread i focused more on the tokenomics mm -hmm. so quite interesting uh the amount of private sale is uh, a bit of a hot topic but yeah i, I like the overall paper 38 pages so before we get into the actual, you know, depth of the paper, why don't we just go around the horn and get, have everyone give their first impressions of, you know, them reading through the paper and what they thought of it. Jesse? I think it was pretty straightforward. It made sense. Um, it didn't get too deep into the weeds. Uh, I think they did a pretty good job of saying, okay, what is the most important things that we can share about the economy? Um, and also help us to understand like what, might we be focused on right away 
but then also what are some of the other things that will happen later? How does land work? I mean, a lot of questions we probably had early on were things like, I mean, is there just gonna be a big land grab and people are gonna monopolize it? And is that what's gonna drive the secondary market? So things like that, that were big uh, questions for me hanging out there, a lot of those were addressed. So I was glad to see that. So I felt it was a good, uh, I felt it delivered what they suggested it was gonna deliver. And of course, there's more questions. There's even questions I don't even know I have yet, but you know, <laughs> this at least got me started. Yeah, absolutely, Jesse. I think uh, obviously, you know, we're gonna have questions all the way up until the launch and even after the launch. But for me, it was a breath of fresh air just to see, I mean, as far as the NFT gaming space, this is a company that's actually taking seriously the most important aspect of play to earn gaming, which is the economic model, right? How are the economics gonna work? What are the moving parts? So that, so that people can get an idea of the direction they wanna go when they're starting to invest their time and money into this game. And, and to get the outcomes that they want, as opposed to just simply throwing everything at a wall and figuring it out later, you know? So I was, I was happy to see this. Ray, you in a place where you can give a thought? Yeah, so just from browsing it, because I was on the road traveling as I'm in Florida, not New York City, where I reside, uh, I went over the, the, the paper and it's structured in a way that it's straightforward, like Jesse was saying. There's no beating around the bush. Even though we'll have more questions, the, the ones you might've had were answered. <laughs> and now your brain is just moving to think about new ones that might've been addressed or just briefly touched upon in the white paper. Um, the tokenomics of it is pretty cut and dry and, com and it's refreshing to, to even read just one page of the 30 when it comes to tokenomics compared to other projects in the space that have been around and promoting themselves longer than maybe a star Atlas. Right. So, um, I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's great. And I look forward to going through it more than two times. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll be going through it more than twice as well. I, overall, I think it's starting to shape out what the game looks like a little bit more. You know, we've got some, some, mm -hmm. I guess, work tracks that are um, more clear now with resource management, building, exploring, and fighting. We got some more information on the, the assets, Polis and Atlas, which I think also created some questions and maybe a little bit of concerns. Um, and then we got a better idea of what like it looks like to actually be in the space with the faction security zones and things like that. So overall, I think it was a, a nine out of 10. Um, and I think there was some pretty interesting um, uh, miss on the person who was doing the editing there. But we'll see if anyone catches on in the deck as we go through. And hey, oh, yeah, I just sorry, just I just wanted to mention that uh, I forget fancy the list of different guilds that was created and what the guild is about, but uh, not to derail the conversation about the white paper. I mean, the the, uh, the paper of, that we're talking about now, but um, I, w I would suggest, and I would think that every guild is about money, not just Rome. So I just want to throw it out there because why are you playing this game versus a different one? You know, what what what's the most appealing thing that's attracting people to this game versus staying on Eve, right? Right. You know, it happened on Eve. It's going to happen here. So I don't know whatever your other guild is, is uh, focusing on. But, um, yeah, I just want to point that out. <laughs> it's It's got to be about money because it costs the money to play at the level of the game right. that matters most. So unless they're just, you know, uh, they've got that kind of disposable income where this is entertainment, which I really doubt that's the case for all the guilds. Chances are it's for the, they're in for the same reasons to play to earn. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, think we've labeled that because uh, if we don't have much information out there, like that's our intention at the moment. We really don't want to say we're going to do something and then just decide for something completely different. So, yeah, well, I mean, like, 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 it's, it's a bit about money. Go on. I mean, every every guild is going to provide the best experience for their players, right? I mean, that's that's what all guilds for, are for. And you know, just to coast on on what Ray said, I mean, yeah, I mean focusing on on getting a return on the amount of money that people are going to put into this thing isn't you know by any means a, a negative or a focus i mean we're all here to play and have fun right so you know that's <laughs> it's yeah. uh it'll be yeah, all right we'll, we'll think of a bad description yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah I, think, I think i think i think just to finish up i think uh, our authenticity is what kind of polarizes people with us right because we're not afraid to go at the devs we'll, we'll go after what we actually want you know we we come clean on we're, we're a little bit more open and transparent about things we're not just going to say oh we're we're here to hunt rabbits no we're not we're here to yeah. you know 
come in and dominate. That's what we're here to do. You know, I think a lot of us come into this space as either business people or entrepreneurs. Um, and I think we've kind of coalesced here under that uh, umbrella as well. Uh, and uh, we almost always internally talk about what the what the outcome is, what the, what the return on investment is as part of our conversation about new games. So I think there is going to be a lot of people who are going into this space with the idea of making money. Um, however, we have some dev companies who continue to want to say it's about the game, not about making the money. But we know at the end of the day that people who are spending tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars are not doing that just to play a game. You can do that for far cheaper. Absolutely. As we dig into this this uh, economic white paper, um, and I know we'll get there at some point because it's a little further down here, but I'd like to at least call it out in the beginning, uh, kind of uh, dovetailing into what you were saying, bona fide about us being transparent and, and not uh, shying away from calling out. I would say that through this whole journey with Star Atlas thus far, um, I have now come across, and I think this is the case for a few of us, something that is now this established itself as kind of the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, tied to the tokenomics and we'll, we'll get there, but uh, for, you know, if there's any devs or anyone part of the Star Atlas team watching, we truly want to know what's up with the private sale of Polis because it basically positions things so that the game will be monopolized. And we were all kind of hoping and, and kind of dreaming and, and thinking that this was going to be decentralized and that wealth would be spread and that'd be a level playing field at the beginning. But that is the biggest and first red flag that suggests cronyism in that it's basically going to be a handful of people that have an excessive amount of power. And while a number of people have tried to inquire, I and myself included within the Discord, it has been completely sidestepped and not addressed to this point. So hopefully we do get some answers as to why that was positioned the way that it is and what, and how you expect it to play out without it having the negative impact that it's had in other games. Yeah, you know, when I think about that and, and that's one of the only sticking points so far in this entire dev team and, and everything they've shown us so far is the um, kind of the silence about the private investors and I, and I get it if you've got people who invested in the game and the development of the game at the outset you want to take care of them i think the biggest concern i have is what they're being uh, uh compensated with has you know an outcome in and out of the game that could put an unfair advantage to whatever group that is and um, I think this game to be successful there needs to be not haves and have nots but the opportunity for everybody and We've already seen other games where, you know, people buy everything out within seconds and then all of a sudden it becomes a whale sport. Um, and in order for a game like this to be successful, you can't have, you know, 10 whales trading coins with each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and uh, shout that out, Jesse. You never disappoint. <laughs> Appreciate you uh, bringing that up, but we'll get into it. Yeah. I couldn't help just but just bring up this this screenshot that's related to it because it's not a small amount. When we see the private token sale and you see that dark gray there across the bottom, that's a substantial amount compared to what we're about to enter, which is the public sale. And that public sale is that uh, uh, you know, the two percent that ends up being a whole lot smaller. So it's it is concerning. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other thing that is is unknown and i don't know that we'll ever get the answer is how much are these tokens being sold for so are they getting a cheaper amount or a cheaper strike price than we would on the open market and then if that's the case can they dump into the open market or are they just doing it to go into swap pools i really want to know what they're doing with it because um, i think it has so much of an impact on where a guild or a clan that wants to get big they need to be away from that nonsense because there's always going to be this undue influence in polis within the metaverse that you're fighting against when you look at a graph like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that you, you just hit it on the head because the governance token is uh, actually an in-game governance token. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's that's a huge issue that uh, could could tie in when we're when we're talking about which way the game's going to go. Um, especially when you look at the competitors of like the Eve Online and things like that, where the economics and the political system were so important to the to the future of the game. Um, that's going to play out. You know, who holds these tokens is going to play out in a huge way in Star Atlas if they this desire to have any kind of effect, which they might. Right. 
You know, the interesting thing about that two-year vesting period on the private sales is um, also something that we should probably seek to find out is, it, the, can they vote during that vesting period? Or is it like a traditional stock where you can't act on it until it vests? That, that makes a big difference in my perception of the private token sales for the first two years. If they're taking their full allocation on day one, I don't think that's right. But if it's vesting over two years and we get a two-year head start, maybe I'm a little bit more uh, reasonable about that. Hey, Jesse, uh, right quick, can you uh, oops, can you answer this question from uh, Grand Vizier? Mm -hmm. That's not the one. Hold on. Is, uh, he's asking, is team light gray? Yeah, so the team is right here. So basically what we're looking at in this here is we can see this section, which represents team. And this makes sense because it's in alignment with what they've shared with us in the past, uh, where it's 30%, I believe, it shows up here on the, on the one above it right here. Yeah, so team is 30%. And that makes sense because that's essentially them saying, hey, you know what? We want to control the direction of development and the vote during the time where we're bringing this world to life. And that's great, and I can see that. But the fact that almost equal in size uh, is the private sale, that, you know, who is that? Are they gonna remain anonymous? Uh, as as, uh, as Banjo mentioned, will they have voting uh, capability? Like why, why in Polis? Why, I mean, I can see if you're trying to reward some folks for having supported the project, why did it have to be in the governance token as opposed to perhaps you know, Atlas or something else, especially to such a large degree. When you see right above this gray, you see that uh, little tiny dark line. That's about that's what's about to happen. That's the public presale. <laughs> so that's yep. in comparison to the private. It's uh, it's absurd. <laughs> that's a that's a good call, uh, Grand Vizier. Good catch. And uh, let's welcome back Ray Vez also. Oh, yeah, I think I think the. Uh, the, gray, the light gray, I don't have a problem with. I understand it. It's their game. They're trying to build a vision. I think they're genuine in their intention of letting it go or becoming a vendor in the metaverse down the line. Um, but they have a lot to do between then and there. Um, but with the private sales, I think that's always going to be a sticking point in all of our minds who look at how do you make um, advancements within the metaverse that to your success or your guild success or your clan or whatever you want to call it. And when you know you're fighting up against a large group that has an undue influence, makes it a little bit more challenging and you have to be more strategic about where you're going to place yourself in a metaverse where your neighbor could be, um, you know, a doorstep away from knocking you out with polis. Right. And I just want to reiterate what we're all saying, because we're all kind of saying it a little bit, but not being clear. We're not saying that the devs are or anybody's doing anything malicious, no. but this is a concern uh, going forward. You know, hopefully it's not going to end up that way but it could be that way and that's and we're, we're always going to co go and be open and honest about the things we see in these games right i'm glad you brought that up bonafide because i think there's a lot of people who are coming from star atlas who may not know us that well and and mm -hmm. really we we love the games we talk about but we are critical of them uh, we love them. We invest in them. Uh, yeah. we're, we're right there with you. Our pockets are in there too. So it's not like we're 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 fudding the market. Yeah. But at the same time, we we we're not uh we're not going to be blind <laughs> yeah. to what's going on. Yeah, we still love everything this team is doing with this one. Absolutely, point, one point. So. We're covering it because it's one of the best out there. Yeah. Any other thoughts on the on the distribution before we go up to the top of the paper and work our way in? Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we've got goals of the economy, and, and really that's about what, um, if you could scroll down to that section, Jesse, that's really around what the whole idea of the game is. Um, and then down in within the uh, white paper, they also have different things about their different, I guess what I would call profession lines. We'll get into that, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the tokenomics. So let's scroll down to, uh, keep going, keep going. All right. So I, I don't think there's anything here in these two paragraphs that really took me by surprise. This is just a, a reiteration of what the game is um, for everybody. Did anybody have any other thoughts? It's pretty much uh, like the colonization of America and space. There's going to be a lot of land to conquer, but in a couple of years it might all be claimed and then it's a completely different game from what we start with. It's, it's going to be like evolutionary gameplay, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Well said, and, man. And I think this skill tree progression thing that they're talking about, which the way they explain it is different than I've seen in other MMOs, but I still don't quite understand 
um, what it is. Because most games that I've ever played also have a skill tree progression within them. So did anyone have any thoughts on this section here? I, I felt like what they were doing was they were kind of giving an idea of, I mean, obviously this is going to be a sandboxy player generated content kind of game, but I think what they were doing was giving an alternative alternative to like the traditional quest system, right? Go to, go kill 10 rabbits, go kill 10 wolves. No, you're going to progress your character uh, abilities personally. That's going to be your, your, your back, your background quest line, your, your monotonous tasks that you're doing over and over your gameplay loop is going to be you fleshing out your character for me. Yeah. And it's also going to be interesting to to determine the best use, most efficient efficient use of your 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 atlas, you know, and your in game currency. Uh, some people might want to immediately feel like they want to go out and, and buy up resources. Uh, as we're here, it's obvious that if you uh, pay attention to your skill tree and level up your skills, it's actually going to give you some unique advantages. We don't know how much yet, but it certainly has an impact on the resources you generate and the way that you're able to you know, navigate the world as a whole. So it's, it becomes that question of balance. How much do you put into uh, buying resources and assets versus investing in yourself? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's, I think you know, me and Banjo have had some, some conversations back line about this several times. And I think this is one of the most exciting and interesting things to me. Like uh, back in the day, you had that game in Tropia where people were spending real world money and they were, they called it skilling where you would actually put thousands of dollars into your character in order to be good at a certain thing to hope to, to make money. And the Entropia game was really just, uh, uh, it wasn't really a good play to earn game, but um, the idea uh, of that, I think that's what they're doing here. And hopefully it'll, it'll play out uh, better, you know, where you actually be able to, you know, invest into yourself skill wise and get a better return because of it. When, when I look at that section, what I see is, is the headline. So minimizing player fatigue and, and multi-account clutter. And uh, I'll start with the second, I think multi-account clutter we've all dealt with in different games where you need to have a different character that specializes in a certain other thing. You know, maybe you've got your, your combat character and you've got your crafting character. Uh, and I think that I'm hoping that they give us the opportunity to kind of do that with all within one character. Um, and then also from a player fatigue perspective, to me, that sounds like getting rid of the loops, you know, like go craft right. this, press a button a hundred times to do a crafting session in, in 60 seconds. You know, it's, mm -hmm. that's the type of stuff that gets annoying in an MMO uh, when yeah. you play it. And people usually build bots around it at that point. Mm -hmm. Or the gathering of the same item over and over and over again, you know, and right. um, and all of that. And yeah, just to touch back on what you were saying about multi clown cutter. I mean, you and I are both min maxers in games, yeah, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, we, we've always had, you know, however many characters we needed to have to accomplish all the tasks we wanted to uh, accomplish. And, you know, I got to a point where that fatigued me. <laughs> and I, I got to a point where I only wanted to play games where I could do it all on one character, you know, so this is this is a improvement to that. It, it sounds, yeah, it sounds like Gala Games is kind of going to go in the opposite direction with Mirandis. Uh, they have specialization to where you will probably feel a need to jump between characters. So in contrast, it'll be interesting to just have all that happen within one. And then also, as we've seen in some games where they have these wide skill trees, uh, you know, is do you, will you find out later it was better to have focused down this one path or was it good to go wide? And like, if you've already done that, it's like, oh, I can't go back now and reset as where a lot of games actually gave you the ability to do that. You could reset and then get your points back for redistribution at a cost, but you were still able to do that. Uh, so yeah, it'll be interesting the things that uh, the choices you make up front now and what the long-term repercussions might be. That's a that's an interesting concept if you think about it through the lens of a play to earn game, because usually in my experience, resets were done by and large when there was some competitive advantage, right? Like something changed in the game and then you got this competitive advantage and now in a blockchain game where it's about money at, the, at its core, everyone's going to keep switching to these new specs to get a better, you know, run at the game or a, an advantage. Um, I'm on the fence. I hope I'm hoping they don't do a respect based on that. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Banjo. I mean, every game has a meta and these metas last for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe a year. And then usually the devs will come through and nerf the meta or adjust it for the, for the benefit of the game. And I think that by minimizing the amount of, freedom you have just to easily follow the meta 
I feel like that's better for the game overall. You know, if you if you picked a, a certain type of craft or a certain set of skills that earns you an advantage, I think you should be able to reap those benefits for a little while until the game adjusts, you know. Yeah, I agree. And the other thing that's nice about that, too, is if you actually have a situation where someone has really invested a lot of time and effort into a unique skill path and, you know, where there's not too many people that have done that. Uh, so they've invested the time and effort the same way that we might go and and hire a really skilled, uh, you know, uh, cryptologist or something, you know, that has this skill set because they are so immersed in that skill rather than just anyone saying, oh, you know what, I'm going to need that skill. So let me put a little bit in that now. And even though they're really not, that's not their focus. I like the idea of people being able to really specialize and treat a career the same way we're familiar with the investment of time and effort we put into careers in real life. I think that's a great point. You get your value and your expertise at that point, right? You're, you're being, if you ever sold that NFT, the value of that would be the time that was put in to build it up. I think that's a great point. I like I like that perspective, Jesse, a great deal because it, it it brings the whole metaverse, you know, concept right back into the forefront, right? Because in the real world, um, you don't spread yourself all over, and you don't just bounce back and forth between skill sets. If you spent four years in college learning a certain thing, that's what you know, and that's right. what you're valued at. And if you went the wrong direction, you went the wrong direction. Now you got to go <laughs> four years in the other direction. It is what it is, and uh, I think that that being reflected in the game is 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 valuable when you're when you're talking about how a, a game that's going to actually interface with the real world so I, I i applaud it yeah well so far it doesn't look like they have any humanities professions in star atlas so i think, uh, <laughs> I think everybody can just go into business no no bachelors in pottery making over here huh? no I want to be the first in-game psychologist <laughs> <laughs> Well, according to the, you know, the devs, you can do that. <laughs> right. Tell me about your last mission. How did it yeah. go? <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine before, before, you know, corp leaders or CEOs, before they allow their people to come back into combat, they have to have yeah. a psyche bell. Yeah. Oh man. Like the military and all that. Yeah. Come back from deployment. You gotta, you gotta sit down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why don't we go to the next section? Oh, All the, right. the economics, the good stuff. So I think they really did a good job of laying out how the the products, the commodities move through the market. You know, and I, um, you know, internally, we've had some conversations around what's the biggest way to get up to speed quickly. And I don't know if we're going to go deep into those because those are our conversations. But um, what's interesting is this white paper mirrors a lot of the things that we discussed internally about how do we get ahead in the game as a as a corporation or a clan um, what do you guys think of this this part of the document i, I think was it's gonna, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead <laughs> we both pause for each other and yeah. we both went. <laughs> uh, you know i i just once again man uh breath of fresh air because we've had this conversation on several games in the past and we never had the devs actually provide us with the uh with the corresponding information like yes you're on the right path. Yes, you know these are the things we're going to do. No, you're on the wrong path here. You need to adjust. We we never got that from the devs before. So I that's what I was saying earlier as far as as appreciating the fact that they came out with this and that they took it seriously. Yeah, I like the idea that when you're just looking at production here, you can see a production flow to where you actually are going to create a finished good. Uh, and there's going to be people that you know, especially in the very beginning, because the very first thing you can do to earn anything of value is going to be mining. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to have with it a certain level of value. And then there's going to be people that want to focus on refining and production and research and development and producing the blueprints that are going to further improve your efficiency in production and refining and mining. So it really allows a person to really specialize. And what to me is what's magical about that is that they are going to have a window into the game that only comes from that specialization and then mm -hmm. being able to connect up and create relationships with other people and strike deals for their goods, uh, look to other people to be a supplier for them for the things that they need. Uh, I, I like how it will be probably to such a degree that a person is not going to be you're going to have to pick and choose. You're, you, I don't think this is going to be a game where you're going to be successful if you're trying to be a jack of all trades. You're going yeah, to have to have a group 
of people that you can work with to make all of this happen because you're not going to do it alone. And what you're describing right there, Jesse, is an actual marketplace because you have something that I don't have and I have something that you don't have. And that's something that you, you haven't seen in a lot of games in the past, but they weren't play to earn. They weren't real world economy. So so this is an important facet. You know, what I'm curious about is, um, uh, you know, this trade system is going to be in place, but it feels like it's going to be largely autonomous. Like you put in your order, you get what you want, you go pick it up, you drop it off. What I think is going to be missing here is that there's no way to kind of build out the the personalities of the traders, right? So you got some guy who's a known asshole, but an amazing mm -hmm. trader. He builds this reputation in the in the you know metaverse for himself. Or you've got maybe this group that's you know really ruthless in its trading, um, and it's learned through how they talk and how they interact. I think there's an opportunity there to kind of build out something that's a little bit more meaningful if it's not just clicking buttons for, you know, market orders. That raises a good point. Will it be, I mean, yeah, that that stands to, to, to reason that if you have a marketplace, it's gonna be very much less personal than if you have to go and, and actually have a conversation with someone and say, not only, not only for this deal, but can we establish a trade? I'm gonna be needing more of what you have uh, can we establish this price and can I guarantee, can I count on this price for a period of time? So that way you at least know what's coming in for your own, uh, your own flow of goods. So yeah, will it be a marketplace or will you actually have to strike individual deals or can you do both? Yeah. And that brings up a, an interesting, you know, thought around who that person is, because you're almost going to need somebody on behalf of your, your clan, to be your diplomat. And, and that's something that they should be doing regularly to kind of build that muscle, get good at it, make a name for it. Um, and that way somebody within the, you know, a, a guild or a clan can respect and trust that they're going to get that job done on behalf of the group. Um, so it seems like there's going to be a, a whole nother set of professions that are outside of the, you know, tactical game professions that are going to have to live within each clan. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts around the, the we talked about production, we really didn't talk about piloting. Um, to me, it looks like the resources come into the world through the mining and refining, um, but they exit the world into payments through the pilot paths, right? Combat, um, exploration. I know you'll sell things, but it seems like the generation of Atlas into the game, which is part of their, you know, their curve there, comes through the piloting loops. Yeah. I think what they were trying to explain here is that you need the resources to create the ships, which then also create the scanning devices, also create the combat equipment and the shields and the warp drive and all the things that you need to actually go out and find the resources so that you can start over here by mining and refining and production. It kind of creates this intricate loop between the two uh, and how they support each other. And I guess the challenge there, and we, you talked about it a little bit earlier, is we can't do all things at once. And, and collectively as a group or a, a clan, we can support each other. But there's going to be times where I see that something that's the best return for me financially in value versus what I would find fun in the game. So that's going to be the interesting dynamic for me is how do I spend my time between the stuff that I know will make me a return versus the stuff I just want to do because it sounds cool. Yeah, you're uh, actually co-signing for uh, one of the, uh, the guys we have in the comments, Grand Vizier, once again, with another good one. Uh, can't imagine each layer will take turns being hugely profitable one at a time when the game launches. I mean, that's that's the beauty of it, right, is that you're not able to do everything, but you, you, you we're all going to see that certain things are the, the meta is going to shift as the game goes on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the guilds who are on top of that, you know, focusing on all these different directions and, and timing things properly are going to profit. And it's going to be interesting to discover what resources become bottlenecks for growth of guilds and technology, because then all of a sudden, then that's, you know, we might find that there's a particular element that is required to make a particular scanning device. And so that becomes the thing that everyone is madly dashing after. And then that actually even creates some some tension because, you know, for a period of time, that becomes the resource that's needed. Uh, and then that might shift, as you mentioned, modified to something else. So we'll mm -hmm. see that ebb and flow over time for sure. 
Yeah, I suspect that they'll they'll probably put some sort of necessary components in each of the three different factions. And I think what's going to be interesting is that will create some okay trade relationships, but they'll also create some tension in medium space where you might be able to blow up a, you know, a different faction ship and take those resources. So it creates a little bit more tension, you know, getting around in medium space if, if they know you might be hunted by a different faction for your resources. Yeah, that's, uh, that's called content, right? Yeah. <laughs> Player generated, player generated content. <laughs> and then Go ahead. So speaking of player generated content, as we were kind of talking to earlier, how there would be value in kind of a, a news broadcast about things happening in the world. And you kind of saw some of that as it related to like Ready Player One. But how would that actually work in a world like this? Because are you going to have to have players submit their camera angle views and content? It's not like you could just zoom and tune in to any part of the Atlas world. So it's really going to rely on who happens to be near a battle or some event yeah. that took place to be able to relay that uh, that content back to you for streaming. Well, two things on that note. I think... Um I think it'd be cool if each planetary system could have an NFT that was like a signal. The NFT for that planetary's broadcast, right? And then if satellite. you're in, yeah, satellite. There you go. Hey, Armstrong, I got three of them. Yeah. They'll be they'll be priceless. Um, <laughs> but use that satellite to be the broadcast for that planetary system, and then you can use it for news. You can use it for um, common. I mean. I would see, love to see it all in-game type stuff, but you could use it for propaganda. You could use it for all kinds of things or just warning messages to get the hell out of our system or we're going to shoot you, right? I would personally love a deep space radio while yeah. I'm cruising in my ship. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm calling it right now. I mean, I think there's going to be room <laughs> for somebody to have a career off of being an investigative journalist out there yeah. on the front lines, you know, live streaming what's going on, you know what I mean, you know, as, as, as all these things are happening. Well, one of the things I hope they they have within the technology is a record button, because I, some of these battles you see from Eve that people took the time to record, they're compelling. Like you sit and you watch the battle to see how it turns out and you start to understand that there is some strategy and tactics they're putting into their battles. It's not just a mm -hmm. bunch of ships showing up and shooting at each other. But the idea of, of being able to record that and allow anybody to go back and look at it would be awesome or make little movies on it. Or as a, if you're a warring clan, if you will, look at where you did wrong and use it as an after action review. Like you should have gone here, you should have gone here uh, to fine tune your, your combat skills. Man, after re after listening to that audiobook about some of the history of Eve and you know Empires of Eve, there was some nasty stuff that happened. <laughs> they were talking yeah. about some, some regular tactics that they would do, like uh, charge someone a, a fee to join their guild, and then once they paid it, immediately kick them out, or have them join their guild and blow up their ship, take their goods, and then kick them out. There was some rough stuff. Eve was, Eve was savage, man. Eve, <laughs> Eve was a savage game. I mean, it's it's probably the first really i mean there's been you know art survival evolved in all these other games where people got real brutal but eve i think was the first one where it was yeah <laughs> those guys are no joke yeah. you know what's interesting about and, and we've all been kind of jazzing on eve lately and i think what's interesting about it is when somebody grows to be big enough they either implode from inside somebody just self-destructs completely or you get these alliances that are just huge alliances to go after each other. And it's almost like um, any of the the major space IPs. You could make a story, a story out of these Eve um, battles that have taken place. And you know some of these content creators uh, on YouTube who are kind of telling the history are doing a great job of, of kind of explaining the story arc of Eve over time. Yeah, I, I didn't play Eve, but I did play Ark Survival and one of the, the core tenets of that game was yeah you'd have a bunch of very powerful tribes come together and they would create an alliance and that alliance would dominate the game for a period of time and then the alliance would break up go to war and out of that would be formed new alliances <laughs> yeah. and it was just a constant recycling of the new alliance who's in who's out and certain guilds built reputations over time to where they kind of always were in the top alliance or you know, kind of not, you know, because of that. But um, it's, yeah, it's an interesting thing to see how it all plays out. 
One of the interesting uh, aspects there about dominance within that game that uh, probably a lot of people didn't see coming is that when you had, you know, we already talked about this, how a casino that was making more money than it knew what to even do with. And then someone got on its bad side and it just bountied the heck out of that whole freaking guild. Anyone and everyone, hey, you want to make some money? Go beat up on them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's a real world strategy, right? Yeah. I mean, even 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 like that uh that series uh game of thrones even touched on it yeah. you know when when the uh the lannisters or whatever they were they were running everything what was that a mercenary get, army what was that they had a mercenary army in there too that they that they well, well they got a bunch of money company yeah yeah they, they got a bunch of money and then they were getting kind of behind on their tab and the guy from the their their version of the imf basically was yeah. like hey uh you know what happens if you don't pay your tab right, right. we're going to fund the entire world <laughs> to come after you. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. You know, there's an opportunity for some of these whale players to really try and play those games out. You always hear about how some, you know, large family, world families funded both sides of different combat and different battles. It'd be interesting to, for a whale to kind of play that role within the metaverse, see how it works out. Yeah. Definitely be interesting. While we're here on the pilot section, uh, I think one of the big takeaways from this here is that there's pretty much two primary components there in the darker gray at the top, combat and exploration, and how both of them are rewarded with Atlas and equipment drops. Now, the exploration could be you could find and salvage something that's out there. You might find uh, some alien technology on a planet somewhere, and there's probably going to be missions as well that reward you in payment in the form of Atlas. But uh, the combat equipment drops, I'm assuming that's by acquiring, you know, ships, salvage from ships that you may have taken mm -hmm. out. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people that that's probably going to be their primary focus and they won't even uh, be into the whole other section of mining and production and research and development. They're just like, give me my ship, man. Let me get out there. Put me in yeah. code. <laughs> this speaks to my point before. Like, I see the value in mining and, and I see the... Um, I'm going to go into it. Who isn't, right? That's how we're going to bring uh, initial value into the world. But I see more fun in exploration. So it's like you have to pick one or the other. Do you do both or good or can you only do one really good? Yeah. And so what you, when you look at the three of these, it's kind of like we have the merchants and some blue collar working here. We mm -hmm. have the knights in the military here. And then we have like the land barons in the uh, – yeah, <laughs> the royal families Absolutely. of government. <laughs> yeah, a real a real economic system. Yeah. <laughs> what do we got next, Jesse? We have game economics. All right. So we've talked about this, you know, the atlas and the polis. I think everyone has a pretty good understanding that one's in-game currency and one's kind of the governance token in and out. I think what's new in this document, or we're starting to hear more about, is is real estate. And up before the town hall and this paper, I think we were all under the impression that real estate was just a function of auction price um, and that there might be a, a three to seven day window. But it seems like there's going to be more to, to, you know, auctioning or having land than just doing a mining op. What do you guys think? I think that that's an important thing because I was kind of think I was under the impression in the beginning that who he who had the polis was going to make the rules. And that would kind of suck to be. You know, you, you've all fleshed out your, your your operation on a certain planet, and now all of a sudden, people with the polis come in and start making the rules. So, having that there clearly stated that no, you're gonna you're gonna have a seat at the table if you actually own the land. I think that's what, that was an important step. But I, th I it, my understanding of it is it the land is the lowest layer point. So you will have your own taxes that you can assess for. Uh, for land ownership. But what you mm -hmm. can't do is you can't rent. Like Gala, uh, Gala has the model where you own a deed, you can rent your building plots. Here, mm -hmm. you can have buildings placed on your land, but you can't rent it. But what you will get is you'll be able to tax revenue uh, that comes across as a whole. So there's that tax, but even on your land, you're paying tax to the governance of the planet. Right. For your land there so there's still a situation where uh polis if there's enough people that have the power there and they didn't like you and let's say that you had a casino and they decided as a planet we're just going to outlaw gambling you're kind of screwed if they just yeah. wanted to mess with you that way yeah i think it really reflects on the point that you need to have a group that believes in the same idea of what you're trying to accomplish own the planet because as soon yeah, as you right. get somebody with different or competing 
um, ideas on from a polis perspective well then you that creates the problems that you just described which i think adds to the game ultimately i, th I yes. think it adds to the intrigue of the game yeah i think i mean what you're going to end up with is 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 organizations that basically control certain planets control certain uh areas and sections of the game um and that's that's you know it makes sense right so so if i understand it and again i'm just part of this is just guessing as well from the top down you will have faction then you will have systems could be a planetary system a solar system even and then you'll have planets within there and i don't know if those planets will have territories or if it would just be a whole planet governance kind of thing and then you have the land parcels so each one of those still has room somewhere in there for governance for decisions and for taxation and you have the the room for larger and smaller organizations to take part in the game you know yeah all the way down to the individual so that's that's nice well if it does become a power from the bottom up i think that's going to bode well for the game um you know but if it becomes this case where you know somebody could have one plot of land or or one planet within a planetary system but you know significantly more polis uh, and them having an impact on the economy. I think those are all things that are just concerns. We don't know, so we can't be too critical of it. Yeah, um, I'll always be overly concerned of the influence of Polis, though. And it's yeah. also going to be interesting where they put those pools, because mm -hmm. each one of us, as let's say that we've got 10,000 Polis, we then get to decide where we are going to stake that. Yeah. So that's also going to be another factor, too, is like, where do you want to stake your influence? Yeah. Do you want to do it within the faction? Do you want to do it within your planetary system? Yeah. Maybe your plot of land. Um, it seems to me that anyone who's trying to be a serious corporation or clan um, is they're going to try and centralize on one planet and one planetary system. Um, otherwise, you get kind of just piecemeal to death in these different systems. It will be curious to see how it plays out. Yeah. And also what the reward is like, you know, in the very beginning, you know, you might have just this really small return on investment taxation from from staking your polis with your faction versus. Mm -hmm. All right. This is the hot planet where everyone's wanting to build. There's a lot more economy flourishing here. There's a lot more revenue because the market is is uh, is, you know, on fire. So here I want to I want to put my influence here. Plus, I want to get return on the taxation here versus somewhere else where it's just going to sit there for a while and maybe not produce as much return. Yeah. And I think with with you think about these clans that are going in and trying to stake their place in space, there's going to be a lot of considerations like how close do you want to be to the big trading hubs? Do you want to create your own trading hub that people are going to be uh, used as a destination? Do you want to put it at the edge of the medium safe zone so you have a launch pad from there? There's just so many things to consider. And when you've got some of these corporations that could have upwards of 100 plus members and trying to get them uh, to have a democratic vote over that type of thing, I see a lot of interesting things happening within guilds, even all the way up till we launch the AAA component. Yeah. As we're looking at this one thing here, this basically is what would be your snapshot of your portfolio of your resources and assets in game. Mm -hmm. How much of each of the token do you have? How much land do you have? Uh, how many items do you have? A sh you know, one ship, two ship? Do you have a large crew? Have you stacked that ship with new components? Do you have some buildings for you know resource mining, that sort of thing? So this is the whole thing. The only thing that I think that falls outside of this is you the individual, meaning your avatar, your character, and how you've invested in it via the skill tree. But everything else we're looking at here is what you would own as your in-game assets. And yeah, some of that it would be interesting to see, like the total value of everything, like say a year in, especially like if you had a playthrough and then you checked uh, afterwards again. Yeah, yeah, shout out to the uh, Star Atlas devs. That would be being able to see this in a in a snapshot in your in your in, in the inside the game um, with what Fancy just mentioned as a uh, estimated value ticker would mm -hmm. be very beneficial. I think for for everybody who's who's involved in the game, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, with, with the leaderboards, has anyone heard what the leaderboards are going to say? Because it seems to me it can't just be Atlas and Polis. Leaderboard board should also include, you know, your ships, your crew. I'm wondering if that's already being built into the leaderboard. 
Yeah, I, I would assume if they're going that route, they would apply some like number to uh, like a ship size class. So like extra small gives you like three points, or just for example. Yeah. Yeah. And all these things again being on chain, but even including the raw materials as well as the refined materials. Interesting. That's a lot. I mean, that's. Yeah. Um, bodes well for the Solana blockchain if, if a game like this can really push that much volume. I'll be curious to see what what uh, amount of the volume in a daily de a given day on Solana Network will be due to Star Atlas. And it will also be interesting to see the experience for each time these transactions occur. Will it be completely you know, seamless? Will you not notice it? Will there be a lag if you when you transfer or make a transaction? Because as it stands right now, what Solano is looking at something like 50,000 transactions a second. And of mm -hmm. course, as there's more load and development on the server over time, they're looking to expand that. And while that may sound like a lot, you put you know a couple hundred thousand people into this world, 50,000 transactions a second for all of these things, what's happening to your ship, crew, components, land, parcels, materials, uh, you know, the tokens themselves, at some point you're, you're going to bump up against the bottleneck. Yeah. yeah. Wondering if they're going to have to do an off off chain kind of batching to where they do like a hundred transactions in one and then put that on the Solana block, blockchain to kind right. of, to, to make, to maximize each transaction. I think there's something there. Um, you're right. 50,000. And that's just for star Atlas. Then you've yeah. got all the other stuff that's going on on the Solana blockchain. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it'll be also interesting to understand how they prioritize it. It might be like, okay, these events that are as it relates to combat or something like this, anything that has to, that really is dependent upon a fast transaction takes priority over the fact that you're trying to make a sale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the other things yeah. to consider is somebody's going to actually spend the time to track these wallets. So over time, people are going to start to learn which factions wallets are which, you know, yeah. maybe which corporations wallets are which, and they're going to use that to their advantage one way or another. I mean, if you can, if you can see that, you know, this clan is um, overbuying in a certain resource on the blockchain, um, then you might build a strategy against that. I mean, somebody's going to come out with a way to track it. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to come out with, you know, uh, basically a, a block explorer that's going to track all the all the guilds and organizations in the game the only question is uh if that's going to be you know open to the public or not and uh i'm just going to go ahead and let you guys know that uh, rome will be in the market for that if you guys build it we will come so <laughs> 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 let us know if you got some we're interested ray were you going to say something a little while back oh uh, yeah it was on the on the the point of the solana network and how the game, like, I don't want to make it too much of a comparison to Axie, but there are some, um, some t a part of the team of Delphi Digital that made the tokenomics and the structure of it uh, is helping out as an advisor for uh, Star Atlas. So I'm, I'm kind of comparing Polis as AXS, which is the governance token in Axie Infinity, and then smaller portion as Atlas in um, Star Atlas. And when it comes to the Solana network, you know, cheaper transactions, right? As far as, as far as that's concerned, and there'll be way more that could happen as far as the transactions uh, versus the Ethereum network uh, that actually was on initially, but now it's on its own side chain, which is Ronin. So point in this is that even though, even, even back then in Axie, when you bought your Axies at a way cheaper price, you could still play and earn and the potential to earn increased the longer you played. So this is essentially what's going to happen with Star Atlas. So you, people will come in and if they're not having that foresight of knowing like, okay, in the long run, like it's going to happen where you're going to be able to make more money as you go, as the game is released and more parts of it are going to be exposed and, and released to the people. So, uh, so the prices of things should appreciate, right? Depending on how successful the economy is and the demand and how many people are playing. But over time, there's just going to be more to do and more money to essentially make as far as a guild or as an individual, if you just have one, if, if you're just focused on a profession, just as Axie Infinity is now. Although the prices have skyrocketed, you know, if you were still playing, you were going to potentially make more because you were, you were then able to buy a better team to upgrade your ship if we're in Star Atlas, right? Or to buy a plot of land, which is going to generate some governance token down the line, depending on the utility of the land and what you'll be able to earn from that. You know, 
besides the staking components and everything you'll be able to do that they'll add on for extra utility of either posters or in-game, you know, items or the, the polis and atlas tokens themselves. It's, it's, it's people needing to understand that in the long run, you're just going to be able to make more money, not just from appreciation, but just from playing longer and upgrading who you are as a character and your ships. And in, and if you've gotten so gone on a team or a guild that could just, ex, you know, exponentially increase the, the amount of resources you mine and, um, and ships that you could produce or build, you know, so, um, yeah, it's, it's promising on the network of Solana that all of these things would be able to happen much easier and fluently, uh, versus Ethereum. And that's my, that's my take. <laughs> Why don't we go down to resource management there, uh, Jesse? So really what this kind of introduces us to is the process of, of going from start to finish from the land all the way down into um, refining. Yeah. Uh, and I know we've had some internal conversations about this, but I wonder if anyone has any thoughts on how they're going to approach this. The one thing that's not clear to me in this process or that I've seen about mining in particular is it talks about the drill. It talks about the power station. I don't see a lot of other assets being leveraged. Like I don't see defense systems. I don't see operation stations or, you know, power converter type stuff. I'm just wondering how robust the buildings are going to be. Well, I think one of the things that stands out here at the very top of this is you see where it says land not foreclosed mm -hmm. there's also a comment here from proteus love the land tax system that be implemented on top of the uh, smart contracts to incentivize utilization of land mm -hmm. and so one of the things that they're looking to do with that is land's going to be taxed whether you use it or not and that tax is going to go up based on how developed the land is and so what they're looking to avoid is whales coming in and just buying a bunch of land and sitting on it and hopefully selling it on the secondary market just flipping land because what can happen with land is that if you don't pay your taxes, it can be foreclosed on. And that foreclosure process, uh, as is outlined here in this document, essentially says that if you don't pay your taxes, it goes into a foreclosure state, then it's auctioned off, and that tax continues to accrue, even all the way up until sale. Then they can take your land, it's auctioned to somebody new, so they can, that NFT essentially does get taken from you, which is interesting. Yeah. And then you will be paid any difference. So let's say that it sells for $10,000, but you owed $7,000. You're going to get, and it sells for that 10, you're going to get that $3,000 difference, but you lose your land. There you go. I mean, that, Virtual that, lean. Yeah, that's that's a common uh, common practice in real life, right? So it's they basically just copy, you know, normal real estate practices from United States uh, real estate practices. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's it's a it's a perfect element to the game you know what i mean because you don't want like what, what we see in all these other nft games so far is we see these these land parcels being sold and people just buying them up and flipping them on open right right and that's not going to be good for your game going forward that's you know that's, that's that's a toxic element that you don't want and i like that they're getting ahead of it before the game's even out before the lands are even being sold they're already on top of that so much respect to the game once again. When you look at games like Sandbox or Decentraland, I mean, how much of that land has been purchased, but nothing's actually being done with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly what I'm talking about. And even yeah. like uh, Axie and a lot of these other games. I mean, the lands are being land lands being flipped in these games, and there's no use of them yet. You know, they're not yeah. even not even published in some cases. You know. Yeah, it seems to me that land has to be a smart contract that you enter into, right? So there's the dev system or whatever they're using to manage the land. And then you're entering into a smart contract with that land that requires a certain amount of tax. And if you don't pay it, then the, the smart contract can destroy itself and you probably get your gear back, but you lose the land. Yeah, that's quite a cool idea. You could uh, like give in the state claim temporarily and if you want to move you could uh, get a state claim back afterwards what's what's interesting is we haven't even really seen how easily you can move your assets i mean if if it's instantaneous that kind of takes away from the realism does it take you know a, a week or a month to tear down a, a tier five mining rig to move it to another planet um i'd hate to see it be as easy as just okay i'm going to go mine this planet today and 
win this auction and go mine this planet and win this auction. It feels like there should be more there. Yeah, you definitely you definitely don't want planet hopping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, hopefully, it's not just like click and, and wait for a timer. And it could be like, for example, if you've got your whole guild and it's like, hey, there's about you know 50 of you that are going to tear down this mining operation and it takes into account the fact that there's this many people involved, it goes a lot faster. That would be pretty cool to see that worked into it somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one thing they talk about in mining is that in, in order to partake in this activity, users m must make an initial investment of Atlas uh, for equipment. Oh, wait, no, that's the wrong quote. Sorry. Basically, it says that you need a, uh, a building or an NPC to be able to participate in mining. So you're going to be able to automize it, which is quite cool in my opinion. Well, in the picture there, they show mining drill operators. So maybe that's right. a class or that you can accrue, if you will. Um, and maybe that's sure. the person sure. that allows you to, to kind of click and then return 24 hours later and collect. I imagine that's the kind of system we'll see. What do yeah. you guys think? So you've got your land and then you put your mining, uh, you've got your mining drill. Um, you're also going to, what was the other thing we saw? It was a, you need a power, power. plant. So you see power yeah. there on the side. Mm -hmm. And then you've got your mining operator. And that mining operator, maybe they're not, maybe it's you and you don't have any mining skills. But because you don't have any mining skills, you're going to see a really reduced efficiency and probably time to mine, which is that mining skill in the section uh, in the middle there where all three point to mining. So I like the fact that they have weaved all of these game mechanics into what actually produces you an unrefined resource. Mm -hmm. uh, that's once cool. again, a, once again, a well thought out system. And, you know, I think Banjo will agree with me here is, you know, I like the idea from a, a small guy perspective that, hey, you can come into the game by yourself, skill yourself up as a as a drill operator yeah. and go find a. I mean, you wouldn't obviously get a place with a big guild, but you might be able to find a small mining operation where you, they didn't they weren't able to put their funds into that because they had to get all the equipment and all that so they would hire you to to run their mine drills um go ahead were you going to say something man? i was just going to say i think organically you're going to see some of the small players not necessarily turn into clans but maybe turn into co-ops for resources right where mm -hmm. they may be able to and that may be a whole new economic system for the game where you get these groups of small people pool their stuff together for sale sell to somebody big who's you know a big market trader uh, and kind of build your supply line that way. Uh, it's, that mirrors a lot of commodity markets around the world, right? They, they yeah. go to co-ops and sell with scale. No, that, that'll be, I think that's going to be a, a great element to the game if that's a, a possible thing. Hey, not to derail the conversation, but I don't think we're going to go in this direction. Um, so I didn't want to leave one of our guys from the comments with a question unanswered. Um, anybody want to take take on this one. Uh, does being part of a specific tier encourage specializing in a specific field? We were talking about this a while ago, and, and uh, I don't think we're going to go there. So I wanted to go ahead and get the guy up on screen. What do we mean by tier? I think he's talking about the uh, poster tiers is what I was thinking. But. Oh, gotcha. Because you with that, you can get like a pilots or captains yeah, or you right. can get certain things that lean in direction. Um, I don't know that those actually fall into a specialization because when we look at the actual career fields, I mean, I didn't see anything within the tiers that weighs for you in the direction of being a scientist, you know, or you know, someone in R and D. Um, so I think that's going to be left to the individual to decide, you know, where they want to put their focus. Uh, yeah, now, a pilot's license is probably going to help you become a pilot a lot sooner. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah. The way I took it was it was kind of a successive. Um, elevation and and how you could show up in the game so you know lower tiers you get a pilot's license a captain's license and then i think you get in, introduced to something to do with the politics of the system and then you start getting into the um you know the command fleet type ships that require more than just a crew it requires basically a small army so that's the progression i saw within the different posters is almost how you show up um in the different gameplay loops within the game yeah, that, that's a similar to what I saw, Mandrew. I didn't really see you going into certain different fields. What I saw is that by purchasing certain tiers, you were able to progress in basically the, the space fearing field, if, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that. You know, mm -hmm. it was basically a certain field that you got um, more and more improvement in. 
not various different fields. I'm not sure if that answers your question of a punch. If it didn't come back again, and we'll, we'll try to get to you a little bit later. You're Just purchasing a station in life. <laughs> <laughs> or a station in the metaverse. Yes. Um, can, Jesse, can you scroll down to our first look at kind of the the different economic pillars of the game? We've got extractors, which really are miners, I guess, in our eyes. Yeah, yeah. That's... Right. And we've kind of talked about some of this already. It kind of speaks to just what you put in is what you get out, and really you're getting raw materials. Um, what's interesting there to me, and I, I saw this previously in a different document, is it looks like fuel is going to be paid in Atlas. It, it doesn't look like it's going to be something that is um, um, produced, as far as I can tell. Has anyone seen anything different? No, you're correct. It's Atlas, yeah. And uh, another thing that costs Atlas will be getting your like refined ore out into upper space, just like real life that will cost uh, like all the energy to get off the planet. So that will add like extra value. So does that then mean that you do not have to go and you're not going to run out of gas as long as you have money in pocket? <laughs> you know, what it looks like. You're not going to need. We're not going to have to go for a fill up anywhere. It's just like, oh, I need gas, so let me cha ching here's some my atlas. Let's well, I know it. that I know that certain people were. Um, planning on doing like fuel resuppliers, right? They're right. doing a fuel pipeline. Now we could be reading that wrong. It could be the gas for the transaction is paid through with Atlas. Like if it says the fuel to transport cargo. I think, uh, I, yeah. I think, I think that this has to be, there's something wrong here. Like you said, Mantra, because from the live streams that one of the live streams or one of the town halls that I listened to, he specifically talked about salvage companies basically. Right. So, mm -hmm. That's not going to be a thing if, you know, if you run out of money out in deep space, you're not going to be able to pay the salvage experts to come get you. So, yeah. you know, that's yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing here, but, um, you know, that's that's part of our duty here with the Metaverse Nomads to point this kind of stuff out, too. So, well, it they seems like gas fee. So maybe that maybe you're yeah. just paying for your gas in Atlas. But that's kind of what we would have already have assumed, just like you're paying for anything in Atlas. Mm -hmm. And then well, they also. It says right before that fuel to transport cargo into orbit collected in Atlas. So I think I don't see how it isn't anything but Atlas. It seems strange that something as simple as a, a fuel resource that could be mined and sold. It's a miss to put that in just Atlas. I don't know. Something else that's interesting here is that you have the ability to produce additional fuel as a result okay. of your extraction. There we so go. It must still it, it, that would make it an additional resource. And it's not exactly you're not fueling your ship with Atlas. You're still using Atlas as a fee for your gas. Yeah. is what I'm reading now. And the cool ideal about that is that you would be able to be out there exploring. You go find a planet, you mine some more fuel and you keep going, you know, so. Yeah. Well, hopefully you can mine like a nebula, right? You don't have to put right. a bunch of mo hope. I'm hoping that there's a ship that is a mining ship per se, where you just pull up and mine. Because mm -hmm. um, if it's on a planet and you're out in deep space and you have to drop a claim, an auction, that's like a red alert to whoever's around you. Yeah, um, there's going to be some risks in getting fuel out in deep space. And we we've had some talks in Guild about you know what the actual exploration fleet is going to look like, mm -hmm. and then you would just have a mining ship be a part of that, right? So it yeah. Makes sense. So refiners, you know, we've got a refinery deck that has a fixed amount of Atlas. Um, it's going to cost that tax of like, basically a use tax again to keep it from being foreclosed. And then we have the crafting inputs uh, going into refined materials. So this is pre blueprint, um, probably more things like, you know, stainless steel or something that we've refined our other products into. What do you guys think? Yeah, I like the way they've done buildings. Uh, I assume tier one land stakes, they're going to have enough room for just like a powerhouse and. Um, a mining rig and that's about it but as you go up in the tiers you'll have room for the refiners uh, uh what else the maintenance deck i think it's called uh, something like that but yeah there's plenty of room for other buildings and uh yeah it's cool you don't want to spend all your money on just lands you want to fill them up it's interesting because it it seems to me that in some of the literature I'm seeing refining done on the ground and some I'm seeing it done in space. Uh, and maybe it's a combination between the two. Um, but in my mind, moving 
a finished product is cheaper than moving a raw resource. Right. Um, so it'll be interesting if if where the where that takes place and or if it's even a piece that you have to consider as you're refining materials. <clears throat> Anyone have any other thoughts on refining? Um, no. And then there's the last thing there. It talks about managers, and I, I'm just assuming that's another form of a crew member uh, for your your refining equipment or your mining equipment. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, that's the one I'm I'm still trying to wrap my head around. I mean, is it a crew member uh, or like a crew member? Because again, you're using crew members specifically as it relates to a ship thus far. Mm -hmm. uh, so will you have buildings that you can staff with people that are both doing the work themselves? And then is there a means by which to have a manager or is a manager role an actual player character that is responsible for doing something as it relates to management? If they can get it to that point, I think it will do really well for the game. But you really you really need a player base that's huge to start to yeah. get to some of those those types of jobs. Right. I got to get my man uh, Ultra 625 on the screen. Uh, maybe an NPC upgrade to produce faster. Yeah, that would be nice. I think you're going to see a lot of that skill perk uh, enhancements and speed enhancements. Obviously, in, in real life, any team that's been working together or working um, for a number of years is usually more efficient. I think that's going to be a big piece of the game. There's also going to be an efficiency about where you place yourself in relation to the resources that you need. I mean, you could... Yeah. You could be a really rich guild and just have a shitty position uh, in the metaverse and spend all your money on getting things back and forth. I just got to say, this is a very interesting aspect of this game, how you're going to have to manage your crew personnel. And obviously, uh, like you were saying, I mean, it looks like we're going to have buildings where you're going to be able to manage your your building personnel on the different planets or land plots that you might own. It's a very interesting concept that hasn't been in a ton of games that I've played, but only in a few, you know, so it's, but I like it. Yeah, I do too. And the next roles they kind of get into is the builders, uh, which are, I think, production and research and development. And that seems to be the groups that um, probably create some of the more larger fixtures. And then also um, the groups that build the blueprints, as far as I can tell. Anybody have any thoughts on this one? Well, one of the things we don't know yet is we don't know the cost of things. We don't know the cost of a ship. We don't know the cost of land. Uh, and that's going to tell a big story because uh, one of the things you'll be able to purchase will be a space port. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the exact language they're, they're calling it, but it's essentially a place where you can then have, uh, it's the equivalent of Miranda's Land Deed, a place where you're going to be able to put building plots on, whether they're buildings you purchase and own yourself or someone in your guild or someone else that you're just allowing to, uh, to be there and 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 put it down. And that raises another question: Do you even have any say over who places a building on your land? Because you're not renting it to them. Your only concern is with the tax revenue. So I'm curious how that will work. Uh, but once you do have uh, the fact that everyone has the ability to buy a spaceport, is there just going to be spaceports? everywhere and will they all be loosely strung together with you go to the spaceport it's like oh man they've just got one building here that was a waste of my day to even come here kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, you know they've, they've talked about the three different spaceports that they're building specifically i think we talked about it last week it was the the political one the trading one and kind of like the black market one but it seems to me that you're right the the skies are going to be full of these space stations over these different mining stakes already so you're going to see kind of a satellite system of mining or, or space stations there can you build those out and rent out the decks and i know they have a number of different decks on each uh, uh space station D does a person rent that whole deck or do, is it the individual building and i see a room for both but one seems like it'd be a little bit more challenging to manage I think we'll have a lot of these uh, spaceports in the the uh, passive zone, right? But I think when you start going out a little further afield, uh, you're going to have that mentality of, uh, you know, nice spaceport you got there. Uh, be a shame if somebody <laughs> <laughs> blew it up and built another one. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I don't I don't know that that's going to be a problem. <laughs> in the in the in the majority of the game but i do think like you say that you're going to have a, a interesting composition 
and competition level in the in the passive area, you know. Yeah. And then the other thing to consider, too, is uh, so you build a spaceport. You've got now you've got this place where you can start plugging stuff in. Are there going to be some things that you just absolutely can't live without? Like, yeah. for example, is a cantina going to be a thing, you know, where people either go and get gossip, find jobs, uh, you know, whatever that it, hub of information in that part of the planet, galaxy, sector, solar system, whatever. What are some of the baseline things that you probably want to have on your spaceport? Refueling, um, a place for storage. Is that going to be a thing, you know, for someone that's like, hey, man, I'm trying to offload this stuff. It's not selling right now, but I need a place to put it. Otherwise, my ship is just stuck in limbo. You know, so what are those baseline buildings you might need? Well, I know, I know off the bat, we've been told that, you know, you're going to have the access to the markets, right? So yeah. that's obviously going to be a staple, right? And then, I don't know, maybe you have access to casinos or, you know, I mean, it's going to be interesting, like you say. It's interesting. So as I see it so far, based on what we've read, there's going to be, you know, kind of a repair and maintenance deck there's or a ship deck, if you will. There's going to be a science deck. There'll probably be a um, um, some sort of retail deck. And I think there's also going to be a the university deck where you can go and send your, your people to get their skills upgraded. Yeah. Those seem to be the ones that I've seen so far. I think it's how does the retail of the entrepreneur deck turn out? Because they've been pretty clear that they want there's going to be situations where people never have to leave a space station to be profitable. And speaking of Academy and crew, the game mechanic that I'm still unclear on, but I'm curious how that's going to work. Let's say that you purchased tier three and you got that pretty cool ship. I think this is, let me see if I got it here. If I'm correct, I think this is the ship that a tier three person kind of gets as they're with that tier three uh, poster. Yeah, the Visa uh, Opod, I think, is what they call it. Yeah. So you've got this ship. Obviously, and, and some of the other images that we've seen of this ship uh, make it clear that, you know, it's it's a big ship. Let me think of it. Yeah, I've got it right here. So you can see a person down below on the bottom there. Mm -hmm. That's how big that ship is. So obviously, it requires a bit of a crew. You're not, you, you, maybe you're running it by yourself, maybe you're not. So can you staff a crew that is capable of doing everything you need on your own ship that if you were a solo, Han Solo, <laughs> if you were <laughs> Solo, <laughs> would you be able to? Uh, would you be able to like just travel the universe with your crew that you've assembled that are essentially NFTs and that you may have leveled up with the appropriate skills? <clears throat> and can you take someone that's a guildie perhaps and plug them into one of those roles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly I hope. I certainly hope that's the case because this is one of the ships that caught my eye, and I think they positioned it as a, a an exploration scanning ship. Um, so one, I hope it's not too expensive because. I see myself out in deep space doing some exploration uh, and I certainly don't want to put too much money into something that I could lose. Um, but I agree. If, if there's a number of roles on this spaceship that friends or guild mates can join and be a part of and grow their skill in, I think it'd be awesome to have a, a like a, your permanent little crew that you go out and do your missions with. Absolutely. Cause they, they also said that crew members staying together over a certain amount of time builds a rapport which is also valuable right so I yeah mean, crew, that, crew that's been to the same academy and then mm -hmm. also length of tour together yeah right so it seems to me with the, if you think of it from a guild perspective you, you really want your hub for your guild so the people can go through those <laughs> universities and and all that stuff at the same time right 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 you 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 definitely want to focus your your, your, your guild in a, in a certain direction as a team you know so mm -hmm. Well, down in research and development, I think we get a little bit of a perspective on maybe some more buildings. Um, it says, you know, to operate, it needs to be placed on land that's not foreclosed. So it looks like the function of R&D or the science track does have some place on a planetary planetary body. What do you think? Akin to crafting or alchemy. Yeah. Let's uh, bring Ray back in. Oh. I heard someone pop in. There we go. Welcome back, Ray. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> R&D is actually one of the ones that is of high interest to me. But what I don't know is that is it going to be – are the game mechanics going to be such to where 
it doesn't create this overwhelming crafting length of time and uh, acquisition of materials and resources to make it worth your while. And that's one of those things that probably have to be balanced out over time. But I love the idea of what it ultimately means about how it can really give a significant advantage in every key way that matters within the game, from mining to building production to combat to exploration. Uh, it really is going to be one of the it, it'll technology will be a deciding factor sometimes in battles where guilds or people in combat are pretty much uh, equally weighted except for someone has some special r d upgrades yeah yeah i don't see i don't see how a successful clan can can make it without their own r d uh, you're always going to be at the expense of the guild or the corporation that's doing really good in that space and they're going to outprice you from a competition standpoint uh, i think additionally you know, as we look back into Eve, some of these corporations funded their fleets. So they're, you know, their captains, their admirals, they didn't pay for anything that the corporation did. And you, in order to do that at scale and, and cheaply or more efficiently, you got to have your own r and I mean, that's, you know, exactly it, right, Banjo? Because in order to have some of the best PVPers when it comes to the pilots and stuff like that out there, I mean, yeah, you're not going to want those guys to have to deal with any 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 stress or any issues outside of just going out there and doing what they do best right blowing shit up you know so um you know the guild taking care of that and, and funding it through whatever kind of revenue streams they have is going to be incredibly important and uh if if that ends up being you guys out there if one of you guys is from eve or something like that or you can show us something you know come uh come talk to us for sure yeah we we're really excited about Eve. So if again, if anybody's listening that's from Eve and wants to come give us some of their own perspective, even on on the podcast, I think that would be a great idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. You see how we bring everybody on. Anybody who has a good comment or anything like that, we we engage with the community. Uh, if you happen to be here during the live stream and you're not just doing it on a replay. Um, I don't know how to say this name, my man, and I don't want to butcher you, so I'm going to skip that. No disrespect. Um, but I wanted to get this question out to the guys, uh, crafting recipes. And this goes back to what you were just talking about, Jesse. Uh, yeah. So we can potentially see a system such as play to earn with secret recipes that are found by combining different types of materials. Yes, they did actually speak to that, to where there will be discoveries of, of technology and things that, uh, and through trial and error, where you're actually able to discover some interesting material recipes that give you an advantage, whether that's crafting speed, uh, or as you can see here, improved recipe efficiency and potency. Uh, it's definitely going to play a role. And it's going to be one of those situations where it may be painful up front. You may pay a hefty fee mm -hmm. to increase your mining production by 10%, and you're not going to see that return right away. But down the road, you're going to be glad you did that. You know, it's one of the things that I, when, whenever I think about what kind of role I want to play in a game, I think about what it's going to be like at the end game. And I said earlier today that I was in ex into exploration and, and that's where I've kind of been struggling. What's that going to look like at the end game when this whole metaverse is fleshed out? But hopefully, you know, with the idea that you can find a planet and, and explore some alien ruins and maybe get some technology, there still might be some ROI on that exploration pace or piece rather. Um, one of the things that um, I saw Oven Punch put in the chat is an awesome point of view or awesome point. Can you bring that up, Bonafide? So this is in the document and I don't know where it is and we're, I don't know if we'll get through the whole document today. Um, but the idea that guilds and alliances are gonna get a polis distribution blew me away when I read that. So I think the, the ones that kind of keep the test of time, have a good corporation or clan for their people and do successful in the game, there's gonna be some awesome uh, polis generated just from that. I think that uh, that has a particularly good outcome for an organization um, under the metaverse no man's known as Rome, right? Because I, I know all of you and uh, I know some of the guys we have on the team, but we're not going to be quitting or giving up. So <laughs> over the, over the, you know, surviving the test of time is not going to be an issue, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, it, obviously it's probably going to be determined also on how successful you are and, you know, we'll, we'll see what, how that plays out. You know, we'll all, we'll all get out there and duke it out. But I, I, I find this to be an interesting thing and it makes me uh, excited about the future for sure. Yeah, I think knowing this too, uh, from what they said, it's going to incentivize people to not be so combative. 
in the beginning because there needs to be this economy that's built and it's going to be with these groups and guilds that are um, focusing on just that, you know, doing trading with each other instead of destroying each other, right? So you might have a lot of neutral individuals or groups at, at first, which m might make sense, right? <laughs> because then if you're just blowing everything up, they don't even have anything that's worth uh, enough, right? Uh, but that's not the point. The point is, is that uh, in, down the long, down, uh, and to my point earlier too, is just like the longer you're going to play, whether by yourself or with a group, there's going to be more rewards for you, right? So, um, and it's just going to help the whole ecosystem grow to a point where it'll be self-sufficient with enough players, um, not just us circle jerking with each other, uh, with different groups that were there from the beginning when we're uh, in the year 2029. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we've had, we've talked about that a lot uh, backstage, right, Ray? And that's that's one of the things as well is, you know, shout out to everybody who's offered us, you know, alliances and, and all those kind of things. But, you know, in the beginning, I think uh, everybody just wants to be looking for opportunities to build with everyone, right? Nobody wants to be locked into a situation where they're already at war with somebody that they don't even know because of something that they weren't even involved in, right? Everybody wants to be able to go out yeah. there and engage and do business with and trade and and learn from and educate the entire community, you know, in the beginning right. at least, right? Before these uh, these lines get drawn in the sand, which yeah. inevitably will probably happen. The idea that uh, they've engaged, you know, what, 10 economists to really look at this. And also, you know, you've got the CEO that has a has a background in finance and, you know, is looking at this from a perspective of being a 10 to 15 year project and to really have something evolve over time. I like the idea that they want to reward structure uh, and decentivize churn. So which that basically is doing is it's it's creating a an overall system that is going to reward people for being loyal and and being a part of their organization. Because if you've got if it was just Wild West where you've got a bunch of mercs that are here today and they're in the next guild and they're gone, you just have a bunch of chaos, and that has a, that has an impact on the uh, on the economy as a whole. But if you have a bunch of organizations that are trying to work as a cohesive unit, uh, and then you also have a political structure where you have these organizations that are warring with each other, it's going to create a more interesting game dynamic. And you can tell that that's what they're after. So I like that they're doing things like this to reward uh, longevity of organizations mm -hmm. that come together. It'll be interesting and, if it's it'll be interesting if it's. Um, you know, how long you're staked on a planet or it'll be how long you've been a guild or what you're generating. It'll be really curious to see how they allocate to the guild specifically if it's a flat rate. Um, because it, from within the meta of the game, it makes sense that if a, a group owns a planetary system, they're naturally gaining power over time. And that yeah. is coming through the use of or the emission of polis. And, and just to go back to one thing you pointed out, Jesse, when you said about Mercs is that, I mean, because there are all those type of gamers who want all they're into it for is the PVP, and they, yeah. they love the toxicity sometimes and all that, and that'll encourage them to create Merc organizations, right? And mm -hmm. and be and be solid and loyal to those organizations, and because of that, those organizations are going to have certain reputations which are going to be important going forward. So it, it adds a, a solid but interesting dynamic to the game. I think if if people have to stay in guilds and you're not able to just hop around so easily. Right. Yeah. I have a, I have two points on what just was saying as well, that the economists like for them to bring out this, this game now with this mini game and this, these papers that they released to, to us as a community, it shows that they're at a level where they're confident enough that this will be a success. And they have this, this plan to set out to have everything roll out in a way that it won't just fall on its ass. Right. So that, it, it says a lot to me personally that they have all these economists that reviewed and it shows that what they're releasing now is going to be able to hold its own until the next release. So, you know, that's for what it's worth. That's, that's my opinion. And then also, um, if I could recall, Oh yes. So, so now with the longevity of rewarding groups or in, uh, more or less groups for, uh, for, and what they do right in the game, it, it's going to, correlate with polis so now with this private sale if we have these groups of people that are doing this private sale and they're you know they're, they're not going to be great characters in the game or a great organization over time right they're not going to be rewarded in more polis so the potential to earn as a smaller guild right or group or clan 
is going to be there for you to eventually surpass the amount of polis that they have. You know, so I, I'm not sure like what the earning percentages would be over X amount of time from doing X amount of work in the game. And then you could tr like just trade in all your Atlas for Polis and then you could just accelerate the amount you have to then maybe trump or, or surpass a guild that was in a private sale. But it's going to show, it's going to bring to light as well, like who the, 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 the players are, who are good and who are not, right? The word would spread. And then if it's frowned upon for whatever they're doing, you know, it's going to have their, its own consequences. Uh, so we would just have to see what, what people become over time in the game. Well, I think that's what their overall goal and what they were trying to accomplish, even by what we see here on the screen, because you can see mm -hmm. that all the way up into to, for the first two years, essentially, till uh, the beginning of uh, 2024, you've got this scaling right. mechanism. And then all of a sudden, everything levels out with the exception of rewards pool. So this ties directly into what we're talking about, about guilds right. being rewarded. And so essentially from this point on, now that the team themselves, and we don't know the impact of the private investors, but let's yeah. not try to think too much about that at the moment. <laughs> um, but the impact of the team steering the direction of this to get it where they want it. And then from there, kind of allowing it to take on uh, you know, it's its own future with rewards right. and the people that are going to have the power in the game be the people that are doing stuff within the game. The one thing we don't know yet, right. you touched on this, Banjo, is like guilds. How will they, what will be the mechanism for reward? Will there mm -hmm. be a guild system where you're acknowledged for combat, for resources? Like if there's some type of thing that like a, the leaderboard for guilds, what is that based on? And then, and how does that work with the rewards pool where you gain influence and power over time? Yeah, I think one of the things about that leaderboard um, that's really going to drive recruitment into some of the larger corporations or clans. And anybody who really wants to have a serious play in, in the game over time is probably going to have to sit in the top five on, on average to really kind of bring in the new recruits and the people who want to see this organization grow because people are attracted to success. So if you're a, a clan or a corporation that's sitting down in 20th place, people are going to say, well, like, forget those guys. I want to, I want to, I want to go with greatness. Right. Yeah. So that leaderboard is really going to drive a lot of in-game behavior with new players. Yeah. It's cool that they're also going to reward like solo play as well, if that's possible. Like if you can manage to get into the AX zone, do whatever you want to do, get out, you could make like maybe more money than with a group, but you take on all the risk. Yeah. Way. Doggone it. This is why this still looking at this, this freaking private token sale gets to me. Cause like that's two years of runway to establish dominance, both economically and politically. Even yep. if it levels mm -hmm. out after that two years of runway is a long time to establish your position. Yeah, I, I would be much, I agree 100%. And I would be far more encouraged if, if there was some awareness or some communication that that was just people staking into swap pools yeah. where it's really just an investment mechanism for them to gain uh, a coin appreciation and maybe some swap pool fees and yeah. not they're going in to take over a faction. Because if this was split between three people, you might now have your permanent faction leaders. Right? Yeah. Because we yeah. know faction is a, a reflection of polis. Mm-hmm. And we also don't know if those if these private investors are also going to be players. So basically, there can be here in having a guild that's gaining influence while they have this foundation from their private investments. There's just so many ways that this yeah. could not could not work out well. So that's yeah. why I, I really want to know what's up. Yeah. And just to touch on what you said, Banjo, like it's it's not such a high bar for a notice to come out to say, hey, these guys aren't going to be affecting the end game economy. You know right. what I mean? Like it's not, it's not such a high bar. You can, you can easily say that without having to say anything else. And a lot of the questions will kind of go away. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, if you just look at the, what is token token generation, uh, I think it's the light blue and the dark line there. Um, it's such a minuscule part of the overall generation of all the tokens. That's kind of what caught me by surprise. Yeah. Right. I thought there would have been more upfront sale to the open economy or the open public to, to kind of be first leaders in the economy. Right. Did we, yeah, I was going to say, do we want to go back up to production there? I think that's where we're at. Yep. So to, to me, this just seems like the, the, the managers, if you will, is that how you guys took it?
You go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so. Just looking at so it looks like it's we've got two sets. So we got R and D, and then it goes down to production. Um, yeah. So these are just the folks that are you know that are the kind of focused on on. I, I'm assuming it's uh, what are we talking about? Technology equipment. What are they producing at this point? What is yeah, this? it seems like quite a big category, like the way they're trying to get it all into this document. They can't get everything, but it's, yeah. you can understand the premise of it. And I think they're going to keep on hammering, hammering it down in uh, town halls. Yeah. The next one I'm looking forward to is the Galactic Asset Offering. That town hall is going to be really interesting. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised if it passed like 2,000 live members. I agree. It's 400 consistently at the moment. Yeah. So to me, this is the groups that are going to build the ships, that are going to build the the components, that are going to build everything that once they're given the blueprint. Um, but I think it's also going to be the group that does the repairs. So maybe on a ship deck, not only will they sell ships, but they'll also be responsible for the repairs of the ships. Um, it, it just kind of seems like they're going into a couple different, I guess, professional pipelines. And, you know, you got your people who pull the resources out of the ground. You've got the people who kind of create the tech. Uh, and then you got the people who are the engineers and, and build and maintain it. And I think that's what we're seeing here, which really mirrors what we see in an industrialized society. And there's going to be a lot of opportunity for that for people that want to specialize in maintenance because maintenance and repair is not just going to be related to combat damage. Uh, mm -hmm. Ships degrade over time. So that's mm -hmm. that's going to be a part of the game too. That no matter what you're doing with your ship, if you're using it, eventually it's going to need some maintenance. And well, and so they've said cost that less. Yeah. yeah, and they've they've also said that there's going to be destructible items like mining bits won't be permanent, right? So you'll have to manufacture and produce mining bits. So I think they're they're building in a um, a disposable component into the environment that's going to always pull money out of the system as well. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they uh, do that, especially if they put it on the blockchain, like an expired item. Like they could uh, perhaps toggle something after like, a certain amount of time, or it's hard to yeah. delete something from someone's wallet. Yeah. Well, the next section, exploring, um, is the one that I'm most excited about just because it resonates with me. Um, and I think it's everything that we want it to be so far, really getting out there, trying to kit out your ships so it's it's um, probably the safest exploring you can do if you're going to get out into deep space. Uh, and it's really the group that's going to either find new resources for your clan or your corporation, or you're going to get that data and sell it, or the piece that was introduced in one of the recent town halls is you'll be able to explore like ancient ruins and get new technology. And, and that might be significantly advantageous, um, not only to your pocketbook, but also to your corporation. And it sounds like it's going to be, a, you know, a part of the skill tree there as well, you know, because, again, you can see there where it says as you improve your skills, you're going to be able to do things like reduce ship damage while traveling and increase your efficiency. The game mechanic that I'm most interested in understanding as it relates to exploring mm -hmm. is imagine you've got your ship. So, Banjo, you've got, you know, that uh, that ship we were just looking at there and yeah, the you're out yeah. exploring and um are you able to stealth yourself, you know, kind of like, are you able to turn off whatever beacon that is that just kind of pings and shows your ship out there? Is there cloaking? Um, can you, is it going to be such a vast open space to where if you don't really want to run into someone, you might not actually see someone for a long time. If someone does actually able is able to scan for your presence and they sneak up on you, can they disable you to where you're just there a sitting duck and they destroy you? Or can you take a few hits and get out of there to be able to save yourself? I'm curious what that will actually, what that experience will be in the beginning. Yeah, I think, you know, I think we discussed last week that initially I believe that deep space is going to be relatively safe. I think it's going to be people out there exploring, looking for a way to drive some value and, and maybe just find stuff to sell. And then it's going to get a little bit more dangerous. And as I see myself playing the game, it's about, uh, you know, building a ship that has stealth, that has quick warp uh, capability, has the ability to either be small and stay off radars, but also have, has the ability to scan forward for not only assets, but also enemy combat. So I think most people who are gonna be exploring are gonna have a mind of um, exploring, get the hell out of the way and not exploring, engage in combat. Um, but eventually, you know, there's gonna be a demographic that, that 
group that builds yeah. up to take out explorers and, and find them and hunt them and kill them. Can you imagine yeah. if you had this, a scanning device? Uh, sorry, I mean, it, stepping in there. Uh, no, you're fine, but, yeah, you're fine. If you had a scanning device that basically, no matter what you're out there doing, exploring, it alerted you when another ship was in uh, proximity to you that was more capable than your vessel, or if there were two ships or something like that. So some way you, your own scanning could be automatic where you're being alerted to mm -hmm. if you're in proximity of danger. Yeah, I would hope that would be part of the scanning system, right? That you would be able to see see a guy, look at him, and, and kind of evaluate, you know, on the fly, like it's it's you know up for grabs, it's fifty fifty, or no, I need to get out of here, or <laughs> or let me let me go ahead and step on this guy. But uh, what you just mentioned, Banjo, was kind of triggering me back to what we were talking about before, as far as how the game's going to evolve, right? Because in the beginning, the goal is going to be to get out there and explore. And so everybody's going to want to be light, quick, Heidi, you know, let's get out here. Let's get the information and get back to the to, to the squad with it. And then at the, you know, as the game progresses, you're going to have patrol. You're going to have control and monitor just like we have in the real world. And you're going to have people going out there and they're going to be looking to make sure that you can't scout anymore in this area. You know what I mean? Um, this is our area, you know, and you're going to have a lot of that kind of thing going on. So. I think it'll progress and you'll have you, you you'll progress from the the light scout only vessels to military capable patrol scout vessels right Recon yeah, think, type situations yeah i think you're going to gradually see expansion and empires built out in deep space one of the things that i'm curious about is how the blockchain will be used to give you a competitive advantage like what will you be able to pull out of the blockchain to see what's happening inside the game will you be able to see new resources minted and, and where they were minted? Will you be able to see the number of ships that were destroyed and who destroyed them? Or maybe there's a, a PVP uh, clan that is really aggressive in one sector of space. Will you be able to get on the blockchain and kind of establish that that's going on just by looking through a blockchain explorer? That's an interesting concept, man. John. I actually, I have to say, I hope not. I hope that you're not going to be able to look at a block explorer and know where in Star Atlas something was performed. I mean, knowing that a guild performed a certain thing, they're not going to be able to hide that. And I don't think they should necessarily. But knowing the details of what exactly their operation entails, I mean, a little bit of privacy will be more fun, I believe. Well, well imagine this. Imagine that there's a resource that is only acquired at this particular location, this planet or this you know sector and you're able to look at a wallet that's accumulating that that's going to tell right. you who's in that area well and those wallets are going to really be um key and i think we i mentioned this a little bit earlier but you're going to figure out what the guild wallets are and what the you know the star atlas dev wallet is people just figure that stuff out and they make a game out of it so when you start seeing um if, if they get the DAOs down into the guild level where you're you're staking your own assets within a guild you're going to see what they have. It's going to be on the blockchain. It won't be too secret. Right. Um, and I think one of the other things, if I make another relation back to Eve, is whether it was a community or the dev team for Eve, they made maps that allowed you to see where combat was going on. And people would make references about, you know, taking a route around this sector or this system so that <laughs> it wouldn't get wasted, right? So I'm hoping that there's some level of intelligence that gathers within Star Atlas like that because no one wants to everyone wants to have fun with the, the least risk uh, as possible and no one's going to want to fly into PVP combat all the time. I think once again, uh, we go back to those uh, investigative journalist possibilities, right? Where, where somebody Explore, can get out there. Yeah. yeah. You get out there and, you know, maybe even, uh, maybe even the community creates a situation where you allow journalists to have that free pass like we have in the real world where they don't, right. I mean, sometimes they do get touched, but, uh, we, we try to all kind of respect, oh, this is a journalist. We're not going to touch them, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, right quick, uh, not to derail, um, but Oven Punch came with another good one. Um, can the exploration risk be reduced or distributed between members of a guild, sort of like project financing, so that the main investor doesn't all in one exploration that went bad? Uh, yeah, we, Yeah. you know, before everybody else jumps in, because I know everybody's going to comment, but... Uh, We've talked about this internally. Uh, Banjo keeps talking about exploring, but um, I'm definitely going to be supporting personally <laughs> his projects or even involved <laughs> if I can be. So that's not even, you know, that's that's definitely going to be a thing. Like 
as far as Rome goes, we're, we're we are uh, a community of people that are going to be trying to build each other up um, in in whatever way we can. You know, you know, we're not going to be communists by any means. Everybody's got to make money on what they put in, but we're definitely going to be working together to help each other um, achieve goals that are going to be good for the squad. Right. So. Yeah, I think it only makes sense. I think that if, if as a guild, you have identified a place that has resources that can be of value, you have to assess the risk and you have to assess the reward. So as a guild, do we fund the cost of a ship that we know that could be lost to get to those resources? Mm -hmm. Can Do we fund what it might take to mine those resources and protect it over a period of time? Again, knowing that it's all at risk. Yeah, that's the risk reward measurement. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, I think it's um, like I was talking earlier about combat. You're going to have professions that have to be funded by the guild that don't have just technically a revenue generating function for them, right? So combat's going to be one of them, although you can get some salvage out of that. But if we have people who are exploring into deep space, um, it makes sense to me that any big corporation or clan is going to fund um, uh, almost an insurance policy for the ships, right? You right. go out there, we'll kit you out if you lose the ship. Um, maybe it's a portion of the replacement fee or a full replacement fee. I, I think within Eve, they were doing full replacements of, of any ship for any one of their members. Matter of fact, if I remember one corporation gave their new members a ship. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's something yeah. where we could get to as well. Well, is there going to yeah. be insurance? Right. <laughs> well, they've mentioned it. And I think insurance is a whole nother way you can make money in this game. If you want to fund insurance pools, where people take insurance out on their assets. It's going to be a deductible. Yeah. And yeah. Once, once again, uh, shout out to all you headbusters out there, you know, because uh, like Vandal just said, uh, we will be looking for people who have that kind of energy that we can kit out and let you just go uh, go play and headbust and, you know, bring back what you can bring back or, or learn and, and let us cover the costs so that we have those hitters on the squad. I mean, because we have a lot of hitters on the squad already, but it's it's one of those things where uh, there's always room for more, right? So, I would absolutely love if we had some sort of program similar to scholarships, right, where exactly. we could do that, and those people end up generating enough revenue not only for their personal income but also to buy in-game assets, and they kind of have the success story of where they started from and what they have at the end of it all. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's also the consideration that if you do have people out that are uh, that are within your guild, can they do things where they aren't flying the guild flag or are they always representing the guild? Because if they take an action against another guild, does that you know, what, what is the consequence of that? Uh, does that create tension between guilds? Can it be solved amicably some other way? Like you know, when, when you have people that are in your guild out there doing things, are they always representing you? And what are the consequences? That's the real question. That's a good question, Jesse. And I'm not particularly invested in either side of that that sword, right? Because hmm. there's good and bad with both. There's there's good and bad with people being able to go out, even though they're a part of a certain guild, and be incognito. And there's also uh, good and bad with them always having to run yeah. the flag. The the actual outcome is is that. Either way, like say you're in a situation where no matter what you do, you're always representing your flag. Well, people are going to alter, they're going to alter count on that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's going to happen. You know, we, we already know that. We've all played enough games to know that you have whole guilds sometimes built as yeah. fire organizations. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's going to happen. Time can be like, sorry, buddy, that wasn't guild sanctioned. I don't know why you did it. <laughs> we kicked him out. Ability. We yeah. kicked him out. Now he's a part of this, this weird uh, pirate faction we don't even know about. So. <laughs> Uh, all right so uh next i think we have uh kind of a role that i'm actually really interested in the, the executive roles and this to me seems um really around how do you lead the ship fleets right whether it's a um uh, uh kind of a fueling resupply line or a combat thing uh, it seems to me that these are either the people who are going to end up as CEOs, and there might be a skill based line like an Eve around your CEOs um, that's required to have a guild of such a, a certain size. Um, but at the same time, I think these are going to be skill based roles that end up in ships, whether it's captains or um, traders or something like that. What do you guys think? 
Yeah, I'm st- I'm still not sure. I'm trying to I, I haven't completely wrapped my head around what that looks like. Are they talking about executive roles as the individual and then they are commanding a crew that is an NPC crew? Is that because otherwise you also run into this situation where you've got time when people are playing. So how do you coordinate? Like if you've got someone that's in an executive role and you're passing out these tasks to be carried out, is it delayed because the people that are your subordinates that are working with you there are not even online? Or is Mm -hmm. it specific to crew that are NPC? Like I don't really quite understand how this works yet. Yeah, I'm kind of with Jesse on it. Like, you know, it's, it's it's an interesting thing that they added in. Obviously, it's a dynamic to the gameplay, but I don't get it. Like, normally, this kind of stuff is handled at a higher level within mm-hmm. your guild or something like that. It's not actually part of the gameplay. So it's it's an interesting concept. I'm not sure what they're trying to do. Well, as I look at it, what I see is I see the, the executive roles own the ship, right? It says ships mm-hmm. either purchased by Atlas or built with components. Right. And then down with utility, it talks about component modules and crew acquisition. So it seems like the executive is the person who's running the operation and the utility would be the crew members down within it. So is the executive your particular player character and then the rest of your crew is your crew or like that's, that, that's what's confusing me, right? Yeah, yeah, I get it. That's how I'm reading it. I mean, it, it, okay. It, so are you instantly an executive simply because you own a ship? Right. It sounds like if you're a pilot, right? Now, then we know there's pilot and captain is the next one. So maybe with captain in order to to get a certain number of crew, you have to level up your captain skills. That's the only thing I can think of. And anybody who's uh, you know, live or, or re-watching, hit us in the comments if you know the answer to these questions, because this is something that I think nobody, I don't think none of us have had the answer to on this one, so. Yeah, still a little bit open to interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um, next, we've got the fighters, right? We've talked a little bit about the fighting skills, and we know that every big corporation is gonna need some level of defense. What I thought was interesting around fighting is it seems to me that there's some way for uh, through a polis vote to vote for defense. And there might be some NPC type defenses in your systems. Um, I'm kind of getting the hint that there is that component to um, kind of having a planetary or regional uh, DAO. Um, but the fighters are really interesting, right? And th- here they kind of talk about the executive roles and the combat roles, which I think are the executive versus utility roles um, within fighting. Anyone have any thoughts on the fighting? In the mini game, it's my understanding that there will potentially be some quests where you're going into some form of battle. I don't know if that battle just plays out as a roll of the dice, which it probably would in a mini game. But you mm-hmm. do actually have the means to do that. It wouldn't be PvP within the minigame, but it would be potentially quest where you are engaging an NPC. Yeah. And what's also interesting is it says that the you know fighters, which are really combat pilots, earn Atlas and resources from the salvage of fallen opponents from winning matches. Now, it doesn't say if that's PvP or PvE, right? I'm assuming it's both, and mm-hmm. that there will be some degree of, of PvE combat that will happen um, either in middle, medium space or even all spaces, actually. I'm sure it's even in the private space or the uh, safe space. Yeah. Um, I think it is quite an interesting topic, yeah. especially the tournaments that they mentioned. Yeah, they have mentioned that there's going to be some degree of racing um, closer to launch than than farther down the line. And I love that they're very clear on hey, this is something we're going to do or this is something we want to do and it's going to happen down the line. Um, I don't think they've ever not been totally upfront on those pieces. Um, but what, what we're coming down to is, wait, let me just double check one thing. All right. Um, it's coming down into what they call the overarching activities within the economy, right? And I think this speaks to something that we talked about earlier is the retail deck manufacturing and selling. Um So what do you guys think about the retail deck manufacturers? And then also the social developers seem to be, um, I don't know if it's more political or if they're janitors or just kind of the managers of the buildings. What do you guys think? What's what's your takeaways? Was that here? I'm I'm not sure if I should, I'm supposed to be scrolling that. Yeah. 13 page 13. Okay, cool. Right there. Ah, 
again, it's one of those things where you just don't know how in depth the role is. And is that something where, you know what, um, I choose to be a retail deck manufacturer because there's opportunity and there is some reward, uh, even if it's just through gameplay, there's something about it that makes you feel like, hey, this is what I want to do. Uh, or is that just one of those nat tasks that naturally needs to be done? So someone needs yeah. to do it. Yeah, that's really hard to say how this is going to weave in. Well, this one to me seems so far like this is where if you want to sell stuff, this is where you're going to sell it, right? So it says that um, there'll be production and sales of components, modules, crew gear, mod, and stims. What is interesting there that's new to me, and I, this is actually new to me just seeing it now, is it's also if an operational retail deck allows the overclocking of component yeah. crew gear. So there's going to be a buff component to coming to some of these, these different um, stations. The, the, the one word that stands out to me out of all of those is stims. Basically, you know, you've got to, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you're going to have some junkies lined up to get their bills, man. <laughs> Space junkies. <laughs> Space meth. I wonder if it's blue. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what I see when I look at this is um, you're going to have your, your general, you know how you normally, in, in all games, right, you have that kind of a split as the type of player you are, right? You have your healer, your tank, your 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 melee guy, right, or your range guy, right. And in this in this instance right here, you're talking about your people who are going to stay in the stations and actually be a pow a part of the the communities that are in these different space stations. And then you're going to have your pilots, your explorers, your 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 vulture salvager guys who are going to be out there fighting for it and then coming back to these space stations and using the facilities. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it looks like they're setting up for this dynamic of, hey, you can you can be over here or you could be over here if this is more your speed. You know, if you don't want to go out there and be in all these risky situations in deep space, you can just live on these space stations and, you know, provide services and buffs to these guys. Right. You know, one thing that's really interesting to me about these areas is are they going to be profitable i mean where's the profit center going to be is it going to be mining refining is it going to be selling and manufacturing on a space deck or doing repairs uh, i think that's really going to drive the people who are driven by value uh, down one lane and it, it will be interesting is the competitive dynamic that creates because we all know who wants money over time we we know who's playing for the game and who's playing for the money um, yeah. what's that competitive space going to look like I think it's going to take, I mean, as usual, it's going to take all types. And that's why <clears throat> I'm not particularly worried about the, the the developers maintaining control of the game over the first couple of years, right? Because they're going to have to tweak these kind of aspects, right? They're going to have to say, hey, you know what? The, the, the art guy in the space station is important. We need to buff that to where it's actually profitable. And this is what we're going to do to do it. Yeah. And you're going to take a hit over here in exploration or combat because of it. You know what I mean? And they're, and they're going to have to do that in order to create a more dynamic economy where things are flowing properly. So, I mean, hopefully that's their perspective behind it. And they're going to do it that way, you know, and, and things and things move in a way that's going to be good for the economy going forward. I think you and I both agree on that, Manjo, that you kind of do need a Fed, you know, Federal Reserve type of situation starting out at least, you know. Hopefully that goes away at some point, you know, and, and, and the game becomes free to the to the community. But um, yeah. in the beginning, they're going to yeah. have to do this stuff. Yeah. So that point, that's what all these games are doing. You right? know, it's right. so early on and they're just coming out with their beta or their alpha or whatever you want to call it. And from the from the small games like Crypto Blade to the biggest like Axie Infinity, they all the, they have these economic uh, development updates that come out and it's going to hurt a lot of people, whether you're a scholar with Axie or you're just you know, f farming like a madman with all your characters on crypto blades just to get skill token, right? So, you know, it's going to change in a way that's going to keep the game healthy for the longer, for the longer duration of its existence. And that's what we should all keep in mind and not just feel some type of way if they buff or nerf any particular profession that you have, because it's all going to, at the end of the day, balance itself out as more people come into the game, right? So you shouldn't just focus on you shouldn't be one dimensional when you're entering any of these games or coins, if you're going to invest in the coins themselves, because they'll all have a, an impact. I don't know. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. No, you're hundred percent right, bro. And just to, yeah. just to talk about Axie, since that's your avatar, right? It's like you and you and I had some stuff backstage about disagreements and some changes they made 
whether or not it was good for their economy or the future of their game going forward. But the fact of the matter is, is I think both of us respect the fact that they still have that control over the game to where they can make those adjustments. I mean, what that's what you need. You can't have a community making decisions for the economic and 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 future of the game. You, you have to have the devs get in there and do what's best for the game. And hopefully you have good devs that are going to do something that's going to create a situation where it actually is play to earn going forward because the, the play to earn aspect is going to be what's most important in all of these things. Whoever has the best yep. play to earn is going to win. I actually proved that. Yeah, buffing and nerfing in play to earn gaming is going to, it could be like a complete whole episode, to be honest. Like mm -hmm. If they overreact, they could make things worse. And in like a game with real economics, that could just become a snowball effect because people are incentivized to like mess with the system if they can profit. Oh God, but, fancy! You brought up you brought up nerfing, and and there's been so many games, right, where where they nerfed something to shit, and the community was in a huge uproar. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you like this right now. You haven't seen an uproar yet because mm -hmm. people are going to have their houses mortgaged in, the, in, these, in these games in certain situations. It's going to, I mean, you shouldn't do that, right? But some people are going to do it. <laughs> They've done it in games before blockchain. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be huge what they do to these games and how they adjust. There's always going to be somebody on the losing end of a, of a, an adjustment, right? Right. And I think that's going to be the challenge of it. It's going to be one, it's a challenge for any team to deal with. Two, I think that's why I support the dev team having so much polis ownership for so long. Right. Um, because, uh, you know, most people, are, when you get to a, a democratic vote, they're going to vote what's beneficial to themselves first and then mm -hmm. the group and then the game where I think the devs, they have a vested interest in the health of the game overall, despite the fact that some people are going to be winners and losers in, in having to nerf or buff things. Right. I see an interesting comment here, and I'm wondering, I don't see a question mark, so I'm curious if that's stated as as something that they read somewhere. Uh, Zorbin is saying, you can switch between your main character and any member in your crew. Can you confirm that you've, you've read that somewhere? And is anyone else familiar? It sounds with familiar. That? It yeah. sounds familiar that's, to me. That's well. actually a pretty cool concept, if you can, just from a, a viewpoint of needing to do something else within your ship and you know that sort of thing. Uh, and imagine if you had a race coming up and your like crewmate who was really good at like driving died and you lost them, couldn't get them back. <laughs> you had to like send the janitor instead. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, just makes it, that makes it even more weird that they have a whole character slot set up for the leadership role, right? Because yeah. it makes it kind of unnecessary in a way. And so then it's like, what are we doing with this guy? Is he just sitting in a chair and, and we got to protect him? Like, is he the, is he the king in chess or like what, what's going on? <laughs> you know? He's just sitting there doing this all day, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to me there's probably different levels of impact. So if you have an NPC crew, it's probably not as skilled as if you have an all player character crew. So if you're that guy who's jumping from captain to NPC to, you know, each one, it's probably not going to be as efficient. I can't imagine being in a major battle and having this, you know, switch between three of the major components and and making you successful in that battle. Yeah, hundred percent, Banjo. I mean, when it comes to the the PvP aspects, hopefully the way they're designing the game is that you're going to actually need your guild to be rocking with you on these ships. You know, to where I mean, yeah, certain things are yeah, have an NPC do this, have an NPC do that, but certain things like no, I got my guy that does this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's yeah, going to be right. here with me. You know what I mean? So, and, and that guy might be a scholarship role, right? Exactly. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. I, I, I hope so because that is the most important and and most um, beneficial aspect of these play to earn games is that people around the world can get involved without having to put any money in. That's that's what's really going to make these things successful because for them to be successful in the first place there's going to have to be appreciation, which means people are going to get locked out at certain at certain points, right? Certain pressure points, people are going to get locked out. They're not going to be able to afford to buy a ship. They're not going to be able to afford to have a mining rig or, or do whatever. And allowing them to still have access to the game because they're good at a certain thing or they're willing to put their time into a certain thing is going to be important if, if you want a game to be successful and really be that metaverse concept 
and not be a game that lasts, you know, two, three years instead of 10 or 20, like some of the legendary games, you know, WoW and Eve and et cetera. Yeah. Jets, you were going to say something? No. no. So I, I think what what's really neat, and based on what you just described, Bonafide, is if, if I think about Star Trek and I think about the bridge of every um, Star Trek crew, it's always a, a very diverse crew. And yeah. So the idea that we might have like a, a navigator from the Philippines or maybe a, a, an engineer from Senegal, it kind of adds to that whole mystique that your whole crew could be this this international group that um, you know, don't is, get is me, elevating. Don't get me all together. sappy over here, Banjo. You don't have so much fun. Don't get me right? going. <laughs> I can see it in my head. Like you're, you're not only elevating these people's personal life, but you're building this really um, kind of this utopian ideal of a, of a crew from all over the world. Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the opportunity is definitely there. If they build it, the people will definitely come. Right. And so it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a it's an amazing concept, you know. Don't, I don't I don't want to even go too deep on that because that's that's a that's a whole thing. Like you know, that'd be a dream if it was actually like that, right? But you know, we'll see. Yeah. So we're we're pretty close to, you know, coming on the the total time we normally put into a day on a podcast. There is one last piece in this section here, Jesse. If we can talk about that, and maybe we wrap it up and pick up the econ paper um, again. Uh, otherwise, we'll be here for four hours talking. We can always fall back on this paper too, right? So yeah, we can absolutely. always mix it in the other podcast later. So. so the two that we haven't really talked about are social developers and sporting activities. And it seems to me the social developers are the people who are, are like the owners of the proprietors of the different businesses. Do you guys read that the same way? Yep. Theaters, clubs, bars, yep, social gatherings, events that uh, have the sole purpose of being a social gathering operation. Entertainment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If these crew members have to go to get like qualifications at the academy and they go on big space adventures, I imagine they would have some type of like uh, mental health type indicator. I imagine <laughs> like, going to a theater, club, or bar could increase yeah. that level and it would make them like a better crewmate for the next journey if you wanted to do that, which could be good. Also, uh, virtual reality too. Oh, we can. I, I, when we Go see ahead. the yield here, we see that the yield that you get from having these things is ticket sales. So there's revenue, but there's also the social cohesion and community building. So perhaps this is a part of one of the things that extends the value of land that's developed is by having things like this. Yeah, You know, what's interesting is they keep saying it, it has to be placed on a land parcel. And a lot of what we've discussed is some of these uh, proprietorships being on space stations. So I wonder if, if, if this is all related to the land parcel that's underneath the space station. Um, and that's how they're kind of talking about how you get these decks involved. Uh, and then Fancy talked about uh, virtual um, reality as it relates to R&R. &R. And I, I can already go, go back to my OnlyFans ideas. Whoever does <laughs> VR and OnlyFans on a spaceship. They're space. moving out of the business. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well then, whoever's going to replace them, right? Somebody's going to do an OnlyFans on a space station. I know it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the sporting activities, um, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but is anyone here planning on doing any racing? I can see myself having like a or keep my Opal Jet Jet, it just uh, as a little sporty thing. Yeah. I want I want to be a, a a NASCAR type, right? Where I have you know the, the NASCAR guys get the they, they they buy the car, they find the the, the pilot basically, and yeah, man, I want I want I want I want to find people who are good at this and yeah. give them an opportunity who might not necessarily be able to afford to take part, you know. So that's that's where my head's at usually on this kind of thing. Well, eventually, there's going to be some people that are really good at this because exactly. um, they're already you know they're, they're talking about this is they're developing game mechanics for this that are going to be full you know like immersion chairs and vr like military grade vr and you know the you know 
joysticks and full booth that you can climb into. So the more tactile you can make it, the better a pilot can become. become. So if you've got somebody that's in this full decked out equipment that has this tactile ability to, to navigate versus someone that's trying to steer with a keyboard. <laughs> it's all over. That's the same thing, man, for sure. Well, it seems really interesting because it really what you could do is you could have a, a clan or a corporation that could fund its own gaming league. Like you can find the right guys, you know, they have these gaming leagues already within the different console systems and some PC games. If you have your own gaming league within the metaverse that's there to win, they get a cut of the proceeds and you can look maybe for sponsorships of some sort yeah. as well. I saw a hint in the discord of there being different styles of this racing event. And one of them actually contained a gunner. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, then you've got the terrestrial races like pod racing, and then you could have something that's planetary based like around a planet. But then you might also have like these long distance warp races, which are really around fuel efficiency and and getting the right uh, ship. And, you know, do you turn your fuel on off and just float for a while to conserve fuel? Lots of and good it, ideas there. And difficulty, of course, navigation. Yeah. 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 What, what, Parsec. What, what was Han Solo's uh, big claim to fame? um he ran what was it he ran i can't think of it he ran something in so in such amount of whatever so, yeah something in 12 parsecs right yeah, Kessel, yeah. Kessel run, i think Kessel run there it is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Wow. awesome <laughs> so we're we're up against almost two and a half hours here now um i think if we're gonna take a pause anywhere it's time yeah. to do it here uh, we've already talked a little bit about the tokenomics for those of you who are listening in uh either directly or as a record please like and subscribe uh, we like to do this every week and before we turn off the the live stream why don't we turn it around the corner and see what everyone else has to say about star atlas jesse you know it's as it continues to develop uh it's exciting we're on the cusp of this thing being released soon so it's hard to even picture now with so much information out there that we really are like a month away from being able to actually be in the game you know sales are coming up so we'll have assets we've got the tokens the mid next week so by the time we do this next podcast some of us will own both atlas and polis uh, uh tokens for star atlas so things are moving quite along so there'll be lots to report on uh in these upcoming podcasts for sure yeah i uh you know, we, we, as the Metaverse Nomads, you know, we get a lot of different games coming across the, the desk, as it were, on, on a regular basis. And we're always looking at these things. And obviously, as a as a community and as a guild and et cetera, we're, we're focused on the MMOs, right? The, the, the massively multiplayer online type of situation. So um, of them all, I think Star Atlas has put the level of contemplation uh in that we, we we seem to feel the most comfortable with especially with this this latest paper coming out right showing how the, like the, the nuts and bolts of how you're going to build up your your play to earn situation no matter what you want to do right how, how do you engage in the game what's your plan going forward here's your options um obviously yeah there's a lot of questions but you know they gave us some of the answers as opposed to a lot of these games out there so i'm excited for the future you know just like the rest of the team and yeah let's get it and uh shout out to the metaverse <laughs> we'll, we'll see you out there uh be with us or against us let's have some fun man <laughs> awesome fancy yeah uh i think we even like missed the big chunk at the bottom because there's just so much to get through but uh yeah really great paper i'd recommend you go read it all in depth because we didn't want to just say the things that people say about this we didn't want to read it word for word yeah thanks very good ray yeah so with the anticipation of all these new nft games coming out left and right whether they're triple a on a on a engine 5 or unity or just some you know some whatever else they're using you know it's it's like I said in the beginning, it's refreshing to have something that's coming out that we can kind of get our hands wet in or our feet wet in, whatever you want to get wet in. 
and uh, we'll have something. And uh, and uh, it's gonna it's hope you know we hope that it's promising, but it's gonna be a journey that we're all gonna be on together. So uh, cheers to the future in the metaverse. Squad up. Yeah, I don't think it's any secret that all of us found each other uh, and and are compelled to hang out with the other, with with each other because we love these games. We love the idea of not only gaming but also making money doing it. Um, for those of you who don't know, we also have a Discord where we can carry and continue on this conversation after the live streams. It'll be in the description of the podcast. Um, and then we also have a a guild, uh, Rome, that is kind of a meta guild that is in a number of different games. Right now, primarily Star Atlas and Mirandus, um, but we are looking at Alluvium uh, and some other games as well. So if you're a fan of those games or a fan of play to earn, um, gaming in general, and you like frank talk and not just, um, you know, uh, the people who just <laughs> can't do anything but defend a developer. No, no um, fluff over here. Yeah, no, no fluff. fluff over yeah, here. yeah, we're going to come at them if we need to. Go back you, to that. Can, you can talk openly about a game. <laughs> um, the only thing we ask is when you're on our server is you're respectful to the people who are building these games um, and that it's not a bitch fest. But critiques are totally okay. Come and join us, and I'll say uh, see you next week. Bye, everyone.